Okay, to start? Yes, ma'am, you can. Thank you. Good evening. This is Chairwoman Makita Scott. I now, I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, March 9th, 2021. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, and we will have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. And I would like to remember Mr. Ross McKenzie, who was appointed to the Ethics Review Panel in 2017. He was vice chair in 2018 and chaired the panel in 2019 until he left in 2020. Mr. Mahumza, um, would you please say the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Mahomza. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are currently closed to the public in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair, in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent, may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety, without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to participate, excuse me, to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also um, remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, tonight's hybrid Board of Education meeting is being held both virtually and in person by board members and broadcasted through live stream. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names while making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the March 19th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I'm not aware of any changes or additions to tonight's agenda. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Excuse me, Ms. Scott. Oh, I apologize. Excuse me. Yes, Ms. Mack. Thank you. Um, I, I have a motion to make, and I'm putting it in the chat. Okay. okay. And again, I just would like to remind board members to use the raise hand feature or to put your name there because it's... Um... I did, but I didn't hit enter. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yes, I want to make sure that I don't miss anyone, so... All right. Okay. Um, I move to add as an agenda item a discussion of unresolved employee affecting issues that include but are not limited to 403B contributions, dental and medical premium and coverage issues, long-term care billing issues, tuition reimbursement, lane change increases, receipt of pay stubs or lack thereof, access to ESS, overpayment and underpayment of wages, access to student transcripts and incorrect W-2s. Second, Ms. Causey. Thank you. And that was quite a long motion um, in, to add to the agenda. So if you could put that in the chat, that would be great. I, again, I put it in the chat. I forgot to hit enter. It's there now. There we go. Thank you. Okay, so Ms. Mack made a motion, and I will read that. I move to add as an agenda item a discussion of unresolved employee affecting issues that include, but are not limited to, 403B contributions, dental and medical premium and coverage issues, long-term care billing issues, tuition reimbursement, lane change increases, receipt of pay stubs or lack thereof, access to ESS, overpayment and underpayment of wages, access to student transcripts and incorrect W-2s. And you want all of these added to, or, I'm sorry, and then this was seconded by, um, I believe, Ms. Causey? Yes, 
Madam Chair, Ms. Okay. Kelsey. Um, would you care to speak to your motion, Ms. Mack? Uh, I would, uh, Ms. Scott, thank you very much. Um, we all have received numerous emails over the last um, number of months about issues that our employees are facing. Um, I have raised this question um, many times and have we've been told that they're isolated issues and all the people do have to do is call HR and they will get the issues resolved. But of late, we have received um, emails from people who cannot get through to payroll or HR to whomever it is that um, needs to solve their issues. And I have a hard time understanding how we can issue W-2s to employees when we haven't resolved so many outstanding payroll issues. And quite frankly, this past Sunday, um, I received a call from the people uh, that we sold our house to. Even though I have not lived in that house for five years, my W-2 was mailed to a house that you shouldn't even have on record. BCPS shouldn't even have on record. The amount on my W-2 was incorrect, and I got an incorrect pay stub at a house that I haven't list, um, lived at for five years. I think we owe it to our employees to have this discussion. Okay, thank you for that. Um, any additional discussion? Okay, hearing none, Ms. Gilbert, may we take a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Okay, so um, the agenda is revised, and Ms. Gover, we would add this to the agenda where school reopening. after school reopening okay great thank you thank you for that miss mack so the revised agenda is approved thank you all right earlier this evening the board met in closed session pursuant to the open meetings act for the following reasons to one discuss the appointment employment assignment promotion discipline demotion compensation removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. And 15, discuss cybersecurity if the public body determines that public discussion would constitute a risk to one, security assessments, or deployments relating to information resources, technology, two, network security information, or three, deployments or implementation of security personnel, critical infrastructure, or security devices. The minutes of the closed session and informal summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. So the next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Ms. Lowry. Thank you. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters. Retirements, resignations, leaves, recognition of deceased, and certificated appointments. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in Exhibits D1 through D5? So moved, Matt. Do I have a second? I second. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. 
The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that, I call on Dr. Williams. Try it again. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board. I am bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. Director of Staffing in the Office of Staffing, EEO Officer, Office of Equal Employment Opportunity, Specialist Compliance in the Department of Special Education. That's it. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointment as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Ro. Do I have a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. yes. Ms. Jobes? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So our first appointment is Brian K. Johnson, Director of Staffing in the Office of Staffing. Um, he brings to us 5.6 years of experience in human resources in Charles County Public Schools and approximately 22.6 years in Prince George's County Public Schools as an instructor, a coordinator, recruiting uh, staffing specialist, a senior recruiting and staffing uh, certification specialist, and a supervisor of human resources. Congratulations. Mr. Johnson. Thank you for that. If everyone could please um, mute, it looks like we're getting some feedback. Thank you for that. If everyone could please um, mute, it looks like we're getting some feedback. Okay. Uh, second candidate is Kashina R. Shields, EEO officer in the Office of Equal Employment Opportunity. Uh, she began acting March 2019. She also served as an HR analyst, investigation of EEO in the Office of Investigations and Records, June 2018. And she brings five years of experience in Baltimore City Public Schools and one year of experience in Fairfax, Co Fairfax County Department of Family Services, Child Protective Services. Congratulations, Ms. Shields. And again, welcome, Ms. Shields, and welcome, Mr. Johnson. And our last candidate is Dana Tobin, Specialist Compliance in the Department of Special Education. She brings to us 11 years of service where she served as a teacher of special education at Sudbrook Magnet Middle, Lions Mill Elementary, Relay Elementary. She also served as a special education teacher self-contained in Relay Elementary and Winfield Elementary. Congratulations, Ms. Tobin. Thank you. Congratulations to everyone. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who registered to call in by phone. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at each regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrants are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. While we encourage public input, 
on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and the school system. This is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. As I ask speakers to observe the three-minute limit and conclude remarks when time has expired and you will be able to hear the tone. The call will be ended and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or if someone is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at www.bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. I now call on our stakeholder group leaders to speak. And our first speaker is uh, Ms. Marcy Cook from TABCO. Good evening, Chairperson, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. I'm Marcy Cook, TAPCO Vice President, and I speak tonight on behalf of Cindy Sexton. It seems unreal that it's been almost a year since schools closed due to COVID. Our educators have worked so hard at providing rigorous, authentic instruction to our students throughout the pandemic. Virtual instruction, ransomware attacks, whatever has come their way. Teaching concurrently is yet another new skill our educators have had to learn, and they are doing all they can as yet another new act has been placed on them. The concerns over returning to school have not diminished, however. We continue to hear from members have not been granted ADA accommodations, even for such conditions as undergoing chemotherapy. It's a grave concern. We continue to hear that what other counties are doing to address those concerns and how accommodations are being granted. Our members are frustrated and the situation is, is extremely stressful. TABCO and ESBC are in the midst of a survey to gather information about availability of vaccines, concerns around devices, and concerns around W-2 and payroll. Hundreds of members are emailing, writing, calling, and texting to share problems they continue to have. We have no way to actually confirm that the figures on our W-2s are accurate. When dealing with the IRS, hearing the, number, the numbers should be correct is not what we want to hear. We are hearing from members that they have little confidence in numbers, and with no way to check them, the stress and frustration rises. Payroll concerns continue as well. Even prior to the ransomware attack, our members are waiting for salary lane changes, tuition reimbursement, salary, summer monies, to be paid and more. People depend on those funds. They can, the continued delay is unacceptable. TABCO has told its members repeatedly that we need to give the school system the time to recreate and stand up to payroll system. The weekly payroll updates in the News Hub has been extremely helpful and informative, but our members need to know when they have been made whole. Members have been unable to register for needed college courses because they do not have the reimbursement from previous courses. Flexible spending of 403B monies are still not straight either. What about payments for our state pension? There are seemingly no answers. It is demoralizing. We know that the Office of Payroll and DOIT have been working very close to nonstop since the ransomware, and that the test has been enormous for them. We do truly thank them for all of their hard work. What can MLBCPS put in place to get our educators made whole as quickly as possible. They simply cannot make another issue put on them and told, do the best you can with what you have. They need to know the school system has their back. Hearing their concerns is transparent and timely in sharing information and more importantly, solutions. We look forward to hearing how these concerns will be addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Cook. Next is general public comment, and our first speaker is Simone Voilikas. Yes. Yes, please go ahead. Madam Chair. Madam Chair. 
This is Miss Lynn. I had raised my hand and indicated a motion that I needed to make during stakeholder comment. Oh, um, do I don't believe that we do motions, Mr. Mercedes, um, because I, we want to hear from our from our general public. Um, is it appropriate for members to make motions while um, during um, um, the public comment? May I no, Madam Chair, Chair, we should continue with the public comment. Okay, yes. Um, my apologies, um, Ms. Simone. Please go ahead with your comment. Madam Chair, may I state my motion so that Mr. Bersades can consider it? Uh, no, because Mr. Bersades said that we don't do motions during um, public comment. So it, this is a time for the public to um, comment, and um, I'm sure you can do your motion after the public comments are done. But I, it's, it's, we need to be respectful of our public who have called in and um, are sharing their um, views with us. So, Ms. Simone, please go ahead, and with my apologies. It's in regards to stakeholder groups. Okay, thank you, Ms. Hen. Ms. Simone, please go ahead. Hello, good evening, Dr. Williams and Board of Education members. My name is Simone Velikas. I am a mother of three BCPS students and part of the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition. I want to first thank BCPS for opening for hybrid learning and for having fall sports. I'm calling in to ask that you consider five days a week in-person teaching for our children. The children need five days to thrive. They are already behind so many other peers in the same grade that have attended private schools which have been open since September. I also request that you allow our children who are attending school in a hybrid fashion to play on the playground with their friends. They have suffered enough. You, ha you have lost so many children to private schools this year because you did not offer in-person learning. Many of my children's friends have left BCPS because of this. This year has proven to many parents that we need to pay attention to the action of our superintendent and the Board of Education. I am a parent that has lost her job due to this virtual learning platform. We are taxpayers and we deserve better than what BCPS has given us this year. I respectfully request that the Board of Education be transparent with their plans for the fall opening of schools. I would like to see in writing what BCPS is planning for the fall. Many other counties have voted on and published this information already. I believe returning to our normal schedule, playing on the playgrounds, having regular school programs needs to happen for the mental health of our children. Families need to make plans for the fall and need to know whether they will withdraw their children from BCPS to go to a private school that will offer five days a week or will they stay with BCPS because they return to a normal schedule. It is no secret that here in Baltimore County, there is a culture of going to private school. I wonder why. Perhaps it is the fact that BCPS does not honor what their stakeholders want. For many years, parents have asked for a new school building for Delaney High School, Towson High School, <coughs> Perry Hall High, and Perry Hall Middle. Yet nothing has been done. When driving in Baltimore County, there are so many schools that look run down and old compared to other counties. So many need to be rebuilt. Is the Board of Education just thinking, parents will just send their kids to private school if they get fed up with BCPS? There are many parents and PTAs that are willing to help BCPS. Perhaps get the kids at the various schools to perform a cleanup around their school. Let them earn service hours. Let them develop pride in the school and the school system. Our kids need five to thrive. Thank you. Thank you for that. Next we have um, Ms. Amy Adams. Is Ms. Adams with us? Oh, okay. Ms. Adams, are you there? Yes, good evening. Yes, can thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Williams, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the board. I am a parent of three BCPS students and the president of the newly formed Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition. I appreciate that the hybrid in-person learning began last week for phases one and two. The children were thrilled to be back in school. We heard stories of them waking up independently and early to get dressed and ready for their first day back. We have also heard how energized these kids were from being a part of the in-person school community again. We are also hearing how the days of virtual learning are even more of a struggle now and that the children are begging to return to school for more days. Our students, pre-K through 12 grade, need the opportunity for five days in school to thrive. 
we need to start the recovery of the learning losses from the prolonged closure of school. Five days of in-person school should start with phase four on April 6th and include the previous three phases. Baltimore County's positivity rate and case rate per 100,000 have steadily declined and plateaued at load levels. Many staff and citizens are being vaccinated each day, reportedly 1,000 more BCPS teachers just this past Sunday. Studies have shown that when community transmission is low and hospitals are not overwhelmed, schools need to be opened. Studies are showing the negative and sometimes irreversible mental health impacts on students. Studies are showing there is no difference in virus transmission in schools when distancing six feet versus three feet. Studies show contact transmission is no longer a significant concern. No need to be closed on Wednesdays for cleaning. Maryland is one of the last three states to open to students in the country. We must do better for the kids. The entire country is referencing the same CDC guidelines. If some schools and areas with worse metrics can open, so can we. There are very few honest arguments for keeping schools closed or only in a hybrid learning model. Five to thrive. Open all schools for all kids in Baltimore County five days a week. I also want to thank you for listening to your student athletes and reversing your decision to start games this Friday. Our athletes feel empowered that using their voice made a difference. I ask that the school system and the Board of Education release the plan for the 2021-22 school year and the fall schedule as soon as possible so BCPS families can make appropriate educational decisions for their children. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Next we have um, Ms. Mary Taylor. Ms. Taylor? Yes, I'm here. Sorry, we were hearing some feedback. Um, you may want to mute. Thank you. you. Yep, please. Yes, please go ahead. Good evening, board members. My name is Mary Taylor, and I'm the co-founder and the vice president of the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition. With Gino Paisano's permission, I'd like to share his perspective of BCPS. Hello, everyone. You may not know me, but I'm currently a 12th grader at Hereford High School, and I'm a three-sport athlete. Four years ago, I was faced with a decision. I had the decision to leave the public school system or go to private school. That decision was a big one, and I knew that whatever decision I made would change my life for the next four years. Though I do not regret my decision on attending Hereford High School, I do regret growing into the public school system we all like to call BCPS. I have made countless friendships that will last a lifetime, and I've also had a fantastic teacher. Unfortunately, I can't say the same about the BCPS leadership. For the last four years, they have never put the students first and have always thought about themselves and their reputation. This was an impairment from the start of high school as the standards for students were low. The expectation for students were simply just to pass and graduate with high numbers with the given work and papers the county system provided. It was only my teachers who challenged me as a student and came up with lesson plans that made me into a better student academically and sometimes socially. The work given by BCPS was always ineffective. Most teachers would throw it in the trash and give us papers that challenged our level so we could become better students in the long run. Most importantly, now everyone can see how much the system has really failed in the past year. This has become apparent by BCPS not putting us to students first academically, socially, athletically, and mentally. They say they're putting the students first, but they aren't. They're simply helping themselves. The current numbers show that schools are a safe environment from COVID. Even Anthony Fossey and Joe Biden have stated they want to see schools open five days a week. BCPS has never taken the steps to make these adjustments and being one of the last school systems to have kids return to the classroom. Lastly, with the announcement that Baltimore County Athletics would be paused, it shows me that the school system does not want this to happen because they just don't want to deal with it and make up their own guidelines. If I was a parent in this situation and was financially able to send my kids to a private school, I would 100% do it in a heartbeat. Since September, almost every private school has put the students first and have done it in a safe way. I wish I could say the same about Baltimore County. That came from a student in Hereford High School. Thank you, Gino, for sharing your thoughts. With all due respect, I personally watched the Baltimore County Council meeting with Dr. Williams today, and at the end, County, County Councilwoman Kathy Bevin said 
that she just spent the last one and a half hours asking questions and learned nothing. Welcome to my world, Ms. Bevan. Parents know it, students know it, and now our elected officials know it. Baltimore County, please, transparency and communication goes a long way. Let's get our kids back in school five days a week, five to thrive. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Next, we have Allison Stewart. Baltimore County, please, transparency and communication goes a long way. Let's get our kids. Ms. Stewart, I believe we're getting some feedback. I'm sorry? Okay, we were getting some feedback. Thank you. We're ready for you. Yes, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Good evening. My name is Allison Stewart. I'm a parent of two BCPS students and member of the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition. I've had a unique perspective into virtual and now hybrid learning. My daughter is a first grader and my son is in third grade with an IEP. My first grader has fortunately began hybrid learning. With just four days of in-person learning has made indescribable improvements to her mental health and general attitude towards school. It is obvious that full-time in-person instruction is imperative to those children struggling with virtual learning. Dr. Williams, during the February Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee meeting, when given stakeholder priorities and specific questions were asked, you responded with, we're going to have a summit. Today at the County Council meeting, Councilman Clerk asked, asked about the possibility of five days of in-person learning in the fall. You responded that your, quote, hope and prayer is that that will be possible. Quite frankly, hopes and prayers are not enough. Hopes and prayers are certainly not enough when regarding my children's education. When my son's education is met with a complication due to his disabilities, we implement a plan of action using data, goal setting, and transparency between our school, IEP, and home team. The same expectations of your school schools is not being met at the higher department levels. Constant promises for follow-up and dialogue with no results is a disservice to your students. The lack of guidance from upper-level departments limits school-level teams and ultimately negatively affects your students. Both Councilman Quirk and Crandall implored that kids and parents are struggling and asked you what metrics need to be met for full-time in-person options. Again, you had no answer. These are questions that need to be answered. Today, Governor Hogan eased mitigation measures statewide, citing positive trending metrics. He is sure that the time is right to reopen business in our state. It is time that our schools are fully opened as well. These are the same experts that you claim you lean on for guidance in reopening plans. Given the state's positive metrics and your high level of optimism, you should be doing everything in your power to advocate for the full reopening of BCPS. If that is not an option, I request that special permission be granted to individual schools to approve students with IEPs and 504s to attend both cohort A and B during hybrid learning. This demographic has been detrimentally affected by the lack of in-person instruction and support. Revisit the metrics, follow the science, and most importantly, do what is best for your students by giving the option for five to thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stewart. Uh, next, we have Karen Wilson. Karen Wilson? Yes, uh, thank you. Good evening, Dr. Williams, Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, and all other board members. I am a parent of three BCPS students. I requested to speak at the public comments of this board meeting to discuss four important matters to my family. First, the reopening of schools, including sports. This past year has been extremely difficult for the school system, teachers, and students. I would like to commend the administrators and teachers that my children have had as I think they've done an excellent job. It is time to move forward with safe in-person instruction. I respectfully request that the school board direct the superintendent to develop a plan for the 2021-2022 academic school year to return to school with an option to return to in-person instruction for all five days of the week and that plan also include an option for students and teachers with documented medical conditions to remain virtual. Most kids need five to thrive. Additionally, I respectfully request that the board direct the superintendent to develop a plan for all sports to occur in compliance with all directives from MPSSAA for the next academic school year. Let them play. 
The next matter I'd like to discuss is special permission transfers and the policy and rule, not a specific student. Policy 5140 and Rule 5140 for special permission transfers allows for an appeal process. The superintendent's office has not been following the appeal process during the pandemic. The superintendent's office is holding all appeals until schools return to pre-pandemic conditions. The notion that pre-pandemic conditions will occur anytime is unlikely at best. Likely, there will always be pandemic-related policies, procedures, and modified instructions for the foreseeable future. I respectfully request that the board direct the superintendent to issue decisions regarding appeals and follow the appeal process as outlined in BCPS policy and rule 5140. The next matter of importance I would like to discuss is senior activities, including graduation ceremonies. Currently, the governor's executive order allows for outside gatherings at sporting recreational venues for up to 250 people. Schools could easily hold two graduations on the same date, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, with no spectators um, from the football field, and live stream the event to be in compliance with the current executive order. I respectfully request that the board direct the superintendent to develop a plan of work collaboratively, collaboratively with the Governor Hogan and the County Executive Office in the development of a plan for senior activities and graduation. Once a plan is developed, I respectfully request that the board direct the superintendent to provide it to the board. The last matter I would like to address is likely sensitive to some board members, but is something I feel should be addressed publicly. Some, but not, not all board members' behaviors have been discourteous and unprofessional for months during board meetings. I believe that each board member has some value and that they are either appointed or elected to the board for a purpose. I doubt that purpose was to discredit and demoralize other board members. Whatever your expertise is, the value of your opinions is overshadowed by your constant maligning of other board members. Board meetings have had topics that are sensitive and have resulted in lengthy discussions. Showing mutual respect as board members will likely reduce the length of future meetings and provide for more meaningful and purposeful discussion. I leave you with Thank this. You. As I told my children when, when they were younger. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. It, sounds, it seems like the time is up, but thank you for, for your comments. Um, our next speaker is Lucy Krell. <laughs> she was telling the board members to behave themselves and so they cut her off. Until their, until their time's up. Sorry. Um, this lady was telling the board members to behave. Okay, I'm sorry. Who is... Is that Miss Krell? It's supposed to be Lucy Krill. Yeah, it's supposed to be Lucy Krill? Yes. Okay. Miss Krell, are you there? No? I'm oh. sorry. Oh. I was on mute. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Good evening, Chairperson Scott. Vice Chair Person Hen, Dr. Williams, and board members. I'm a mother of two and a member of the Baltimore County Parent at a member of the Baltimore County Parent and Students Coalition. I hear lots of excitement from our teachers and principals about going back into in person learning. My children are slated to go back March twenty fifth and April eighth. It's a beautiful I could, it couldn't come sooner. I see all the posts on social media of those little ones already back. That being said, we need to make a fast track and implement five days a week for all students as soon as possible. Five to thrive. I live close to the Harper County line, and they will be going back four days a week very soon. There's no logical reason why we can't do the same, if not better. Our kids need more and deserve more. We need to know fall plans now. It's been proven scientifically that three feet apart distance is no different than six feet. Governor Hogan just announced that there'll be 100% indoor capacity for restaurants, bars, and churches. It hurts my heart that kids in private are running around at recess while my kids are staring at a, at a screen still. Um, we moved here to Hereford, not only because of the beauty of the area, but because of the schools. Unfortunately, now we have a deposit for a private school for the fall. Let's get these kids back to school again. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Krull. Next, we have Diana Bergman. Diana Bergman? Oh, Ms. Bergman? Sorry. 
Do you hear me? Oh, yes, we can hear you now. Good evening, Madam Chair, um, Nikita Scott, Superintendent Dr. Williams, and Board of Education members. Look, if you had one shot or one opportunity to seize everything you ever wanted in one moment, would you capture it or just let it slip? You know, board members, don't lose yourself in the moment of political tactics. You own it in the manner you carry yourself as the school system watches every moment. You only get one shot. Do not miss your chance to shine by sneaky tactics of lobbying lawmakers. The sneaky five speaking as individuals and not as a whole voice of the board, yet some fail to understand the definition of what a point of order is or create committees late in the night when everyone is exhausted. Just so I'm clear, we don't lower our expectations of academic standards. Our real advocates for education have been working and established since 2016 to work on a blueprint so every child, regardless of zip code, can have a world-class education. I have questions for each of the board members. Why do board members need more than two minutes to get your point across? Do you think about how one starts their day working for King BCPS at 7 a.m.? How would you feel if your early day ended at the following day in the early morning hours of 2 a.m.? Because a small handful of board members want to debate all night long. So, ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention, please? So, will the Sneaky Five please sit down? And can the real board chair please stand up? Thank you, Ms. Scott and Team BCPS for everything you do as the challenges come ahead of us and BCPS, and we we'll figure out the best way on how to move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bergman. And next, we have Mr. Bash Farone. <laughs> Mr. Farone? Mr. Farone? Yes. Yes, if you could um, mute your um, background. Now we can hear you well. Thank you. Please go ahead. Good evening, uh, Ms. Scott, Dr. Williams, and board members. In 2020, students were promoted without merit due to COVID. Are we doing the same this year? Drug companies invest in different products. However, BCPS has one product, our students. The quality of our production is what makes America strong. Notice how TAPCO was pulling away when they said, we will not return until schools are safe. Safety is an elastic term. Notice how we do not have enough money for structure, for teachers, and for W-2s. Notice how each political poll attaches strings to when and where the money is spent, as if the Board of Education doesn't know what the best interest of students. We have constitutional responsibility to provide an excellent education to all students. Every child must have the full chance to learn and excel. Students suffer today because of the have and the have not. Our society do not have high expectations out of our students. We place so much emphasis on sport, on spring break, religious holidays, and we close for the least bit of snowflakes coming down to the ground we take long summer vacations too. In the times of Ike, the buck stops here. In BCPS, there are so many players pulling in different directions. I do not know where the buck stops is. Please consider lobbying Annapolis to change the law. BCPS Board of Education needs to be truly independent, physically, and in every decision, I suggest the board to be supervised by like a board of regions. We must collect our education taxes. We must decide ourselves about the grades, the curriculum, the discipline, and which building we tear down and build up again and which building we repair. More than 10 years ago, I told this board about the dangers of China to our national security. They are mass producing excellent students. 
Now they are the leaders in robotics, computers, artificial intelligence. Their investments are influencing Africa and Southern America and Central America, and their navy is stretching around Africa and more. Thank Excellent you. Public your time. Thank you, Mr. Farone. Fortunately, the time has, has run out. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Jen Reed Holm. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the members of the board for this opportunity to speak this evening. My name is Jen Reed Holm. I'm a mother of three children in thir of third and sixth and eighth graders. I'm a member of the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition, and I'm asking the board to start considering this advocacy group as a formal stakeholder. I want to address the board this evening because students who have learning disabilities who are mainstreamed in inclusion classes, including advanced academics, formerly known as GT, are continuously being left out of the conversation for return to school. Virtual learning is simply not working for these children, which means they are not receiving their free and appropriate education. These are some of the most vulnerable learners in our school system who need additional supports in order to be available to learn and be successful academically. I would like to ask Dr. Williams and the school board to answer this question. Why are mainstream inclusion students on IEPs and 504s literally the last phase to return to school? They should have been part of the first phase. Ideally, all students need to be returned to the classroom for five days of in-person learning, not next school year, but tomorrow, five days to thrive. There is no reason to keep these kids from the classroom any longer. The continued excuses regarding the ransomware attack are old. It's been over four months. The excuses are not being ready to reopen are beyond ridiculous. BCPS should have been prepared for September reopening when the plans were being made over the summer. BCPS should have been even more prepared after winter break for the postponed reopening of February 1st. The, that way, when someone said go, none of these schools would be scrambling to make plans, get PPE, and get, the, get ready like they are now. What in the world has everyone been doing for the last seven months? Hartford County is going back four days a week before two of my children even get one day back in the classroom. Hartford County is organized. They've been on top of communication, transparent, and they seem to really care about getting students back to the classroom. Yet this BCPS continues to disappoint with all the delays, lack of transparency, lack of communication, bickering during the school board meetings, and more. I used to be a proud parent that my kids went to BCPS, and now I'm embarrassed. What happened to raising the bar? Where did all the pride go? We used to have a highly rated school system, and now we're falling to the bottom in many, if not every category. Everyone on the school board, as well as Dr. Williams, must find a way to get students back to school five days a week as soon as possible. Not in September, but now. The students need five days to thrive. While you're all figuring out how to get the students back five days a week this school year, you must put the IEP and 504 students to the top of the list those that are mainstreamed in an inclusion classes and at least allow them to attend both cohorts until the five days is a possibility. Enough's enough for these students with disabilities and their families who have been continuously left to fend for themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. That's it. Okay, thank you. And that concludes our, um, our public speakers. And again, thank you to the public and everyone who for your comments and um, sharing um, your views with us. Uh, next uh, item on the agenda is the, oh, excuse me, um, Ms. Hen, did you have a question? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move that the board designate the Baltimore County Parents and Students Coalition Incorporated as a stakeholder group as defined by policy 8315 with full rights afforded to groups with this designation. I further move that the policy review committee revisit policy 8315 to allow for new groups to be added as needed. And I will put my motion in the chat. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Mac. Thank you. Yes, if you could put that in the chat so that I could restate it. Yeah. Um, Ms. Hen, is that two or one motion? Because that sounds like a complex motion. It's a two-part motion. I'd be happy to separate it if board members so desire. Yeah, it seems like it should be separated out. Eight. I 
I'd like to leave it combined unless the, the board moves to separate. I would like it separated. This is Lily Rowe. Yeah, I believe it should be separated. It looks like it's a compound motion. Madam Chair. Yes, Eric Mr. Bruce, Eric Brusades here. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mr. Brusades. I, I gather from the motion that uh, the intent is to make this group a stakeholder group mm -hmm. uh, at this meeting, which would require a, a change to uh, board policy 8315. And it seems to me that this is something that would need to be referred to the policy committee. Yeah. Um, that was going to be my question because it's change. It would be changing our policy, and right now this um, uh, stakeholder group does not meet the terms set in our policy. So, can we make a motion that would violate our policy? Is that appropriate, Madam Chair? If I may speak to that question. Well, first I was asking Mr. Bersetti's uh, for his legal opinion on that. I think the policy would need to be changed first, which would need to go through policy committee. Okay, then. So then is this motion out of order? Yes. Madam Chair, I'd like to revise my okay. motion and withdraw it and make a new motion. Okay, then. So, yes, so we're withdrawing this motion and then you're making a new motion. Okay. Yes, please. I move that the board grant an exception to policy 8315 and designate the Baltimore County Parents and Students Coalition as a stakeholder group with full rights afforded to groups with this designation. And then I would like to introduce um, the second motion separately as suggested by Ms. Rowe. Okay, so the first motion is you're asking the board to waive its policy to um, make this group a stakeholder group. Correct. Okay, could you put that in? Yes. In the chat, please. So we'll process that motion first, and then we'll uh, process the second. Madam Chair. Yes, uh, Mr. Brusades. Uh, that that really is the, the 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 same end result as the original motion that was withdrawn. Okay, then. So then it's still out of it. Then. So then the it motion is still, still out of still order. Out so, of order. what would your recommendation um, be, Mr. Brusades? If the board votes to refer the matter to the policy committee for a, a procedure for adding new stakeholder groups, that would be appropriate. Okay, then. So then this is something then, so then both motions are out of order, so then that means then that we would then need to vote to make, um, to refer this to PRC. I will withdraw my motion then and move that the Policy Review Committee re review Policy 8315 to allow for new stakeholder groups to be added as needed. Okay. Second, Ms. Causey. Second. Okay. And could you put that in the um, chat so that I may restate that? Yes, ma'am. It is in the chat. Okay. So I will restate it. Um, a motion was made by Ms. Hen. She moves that the Policy Review Committee Review policy 8315 to allow for new stakeholder groups to be added as needed. And that was seconded by Ms. Causey, correct? Okay. Yes, Madam Chair. Okay. And may I speak and to my motion, Madam yes, Chair? yes, you may speak to your motion. Thank you. Currently, policy 8315 mm -hmm. limits associations identified by the board and existing as of the 2018 2019 school year. And that criteria limits newly established associations from being considered for designation. So my motion aims for the policy review committee to address this through an update to the policy. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm trying to go in order as, as best I can. So I apologize to members. Um, I believe I have Josh, Ms. Causey, and then um, Ms. Jose. So yes, Ms. Mr. Mahomza. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank um, you. I don't know much about this group apart from like um, the individuals that spoke um, tonight. I guess what I would ask Mr. Mercedes or anybody, Ms. Howie, to answer is, would this be a, a permanent committee or a temporary committee? 
because what I'm getting at, what I, my understanding from what the mission of the group um, is that they're focused on reopening. Um, if, so if we do create this advisory group, would it only be until we um, reopen schools fully um, to pre-COVID conditions? And I'll also like to know, is this group like a private entity, like a, sorry, a lobbying group? Is it a company? Uh, what is it? I know that they have emailed us in a more official um, manner. I think they have a president, vice president. So. Um, I would just like to know more about this group and some of the requirements um, th that are needed for a stakeholder group. I would think a stakeholder group would work with Baltimore, Baltimore County. Uh, the, the school system would create the group, um, would create, uh, would allow for elections, would open applications to the public. So, if they already have a, a, an entity, how would that? How would we go about that? Madam Chair, point of order. We're discussing the motion on the floor which is to refer this to the PRC, not my two motions, with which I withdrew. Okay. These questions we're dealing with. Thank you. Sorry, and I uh, I can ask these again another time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mahomza. Yeah. Um, and I apologize if I have members out of order. Um, next is Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm supporting this motion because um, there are, uh, have been uh, organizations added to the stakeholder list um, since, uh, and I'm not sure of the date, and I would just ask Trace, uh, excuse me, Ms. Gover, to uh, look back and um, see <clears throat> which group it is and then to provide that information to the board um, and especially to the PRC meeting because I think it is important to have a process um, by which the board can consider adding groups. And I would say that there are groups that were stakeholders when I first joined the board in 2015 that did not come for years. But then um, something happened either with advocacy in the group, volunteers stepping up, and then they did start to come uh, to the board meetings and advocating. So um, in terms of there are ebbs and flows and also um, just some other points is that there are other organizations, for instance, PTA Council, which has a president, vice president. It's an independent organization. Um, so that there are examples of a variety of stakeholder groups. Um, so I would um, definitely support this motion. Do you have additional comment? Yeah, can I just quickly follow up? Um, I know I had a, like a loaded question um, previously, but I was just curious. Uh, okay, let me reframe my question. Um, would the stakeholder be a permanent um, group or would it be a temporary um, um, mm -hmm. group? Um, I, I believe that's what we would discuss in PRC. Okay. Thank yeah. You. She's asked, well, the motion um, just repeated that Ms. Henput is to revise our policy. Okay by which we use to add stakeholders. Uh, sorry, like, would, sorry, I know. I'm trying to understand because I can't find the policy right now. I'm having issues. But okay. um, in terms of the policy, does the policy state, uh, is it a permanent group or a temporary group? Um, I believe, and I don't have it up, but I believe it does state that there are permanent stakeholder groups. Okay, that's the only yeah. information I wanted. Um, yes, so now it is um, Ms. Jose, and my apologies if I'm doing it out of order. <laughs> Ms. Jose, thank are you there? You, yes, thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, my question is to Mr. Mercedes again, if this motion is still out of order since we're not discussing policy and she's asking for um, changes to a policy or um, is that out of order? And secondly, uh, this whole motion is too open to interpretation when you're asking a future, you know, what is she asking? She's asking as needed, and as needed is too too open to interpretation. A future board may decide a group that's not aligned with BCPS policies is needed and may add it. So the whole thing about, um, I think this is a slippery slope of just changing policy on the go. Also, Mr. Mercedes, she's not changing the policy. She's, she's asking PRC to, to change this policy. Does this motion then require a two-third majority, that is eight votes, 
And I would also like to comment that, Ms. Scott, just as your pre predecessors before you, you have followed board policies and have authority imparted by the board to represent the board and its position. Um, you know, this kind of motion overriding adopted BCPS board policies in open session is setting a really bad precedence for future boards. And uh, board members need to be reminded that this is a slippery slope that goes both ways. So, if Mr. Mercedes, if you could answer my question, this motion is out of order and if it requires a two third majority vote. Thank you. Hello, Ms. Jose. Uh, no, it is not out of order and it does not require a, a two thirds majority. It just refers the issue to the PRC uh, what, if any, changes should be made to policy 8315 to allow for new stakeholder groups to be added. And then that would ultimately come to the full board. Thank you, Mr. Mercedes. Next is Ms. Rowe. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. I support the review of the policy, but I would like to offer uh, the board and the policy review committee some possible motivation as to why this is even an issue. Because there have been times in the past where there have been many, I could list them all and it would take five minutes, issue-centric groups that pop up around different issues. Usually they all get a different color t-shirt and then they fight over putting their name in. And when there's many of them in the room, you could have a group that could have people come and not even get one opportunity to speak because 20 other people from another group put their name in and those names all get called. And then it becomes this competition to make sure that at least one person from your group gets called so that your issue gets covered at least once. And so I do think that there does need to be some editing or review of this policy to at least consider, one, what are the hard concrete criteria that makes one group a stakeholder that automatically gets a spot to speak and another group not, so that that criteria is objective, but also to possibly consider what we might do so that when you have 50 people pile into a room all on one issue, maybe they could decide to designate one person to speak as opposed to all putting their names in in the hopes that someone will get called. And I think that that phenomenon, how we do public speaking, is the impetus for the push to be recognized as a stakeholder group because when you're doing a lottery, you can't guarantee that your name is going to be called. So the, that entire phenomenon is the problem that we're dealing with here. And I think that that is the problem that we actually need to solve. I don't necessarily know that this group is really a stakeholder group. I think they're an issue-centric advocacy group. Okay. But thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Hager. Um, yes, I basically very similar to what Ms. Rowe just said, that I, I also support this because I support revisiting the criteria. It seems like 18, 19 school year feels like ages ago, and so there are things that come up. Um, but I also agree that very specific criteria should be put into place so that we have uh, groups that are, are structured and firm and, um, and are, are real, not just as issue-centric groups. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Mrs. Pastor. Thank you. Um, I agree, actually, with the um, last two speakers. Um, the motion says to review policy 8315 um, for which I have uh, no concern because we do review our policies. But then it seems to get very specific to allow for new stakeholder. I think in reviewing it, that's part of the discussion. The second part of it um, pretty much uh, pigeonholes how uh, the PRC committee is to look at it. So we're talking criteria. I, I'm perfectly for reviewing policy 8315 for its criteria, period. It, it, I, I'm just concerned about the last part. Maybe Ms. Hen um, can explain that or revise that, but criteria, I understand. That's in keeping with how we look at our policies. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pester. Madam Chair, may I respond? Yes. Pester, thank you. I think Mr. Mercedes did an excellent job um, describing the intent of this motion, which is for the Policy Review Committee to review and and, and also Ms. Rowe spoke to this, to ensure that we have a process with defined criteria for um, making this determination. So I'm. this motion doesn't ask for the PRC to do anything it wouldn't do um, according to its standard protocol and process in reviewing policies. What we've identified, and it sounds like there's consensus, is that the date um, within the current policy prevents us or precludes us from adding, regardless, you know, all other criteria aside, the current policy does not allow for any more recently established groups to even be considered. So we've identified an issue with the current policy, and what this motion does is refers it back to the PRC to, um, as members have said, look at the criteria, come up with specific criteria, and also to address the fact that um, no more recently established groups could be added under the current policy. So to Ms. Pepper's point, yes, that what you're saying is what this intends to do, and Mr. Bersades described it best. No, and, and, and I have no problem with how he described it, nor do I have a nor do I have a problem with Dr. Hager or what you just said. Criteria to take to review policy 8315. Um, in terms of its criteria, that is to update or to look at, which in my mind is different than saying to allow those words are not in your motion. The words you just used are not in your motion. Your motion says to allow for new stakeholder. I understand the intent, but I'm always concerned for um, future boards and people who look at it when they can't read the intent of something that has happened prior to them, that the language must speak to exactly what you mean. Thank you. Thank you for that. Next, we have Ms. Clausey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think this has been very good discussion. I would just point out that um, when I'm supporting this motion and when policies get reviewed by the Policy Review Committee, um, and many times the board has uh, taken the initiative and said they want a certain policy reviewed at a sooner point than um, its typical time frame. Um, but I will say that there was a group that was added that I think should stay, and so I would not want them to be removed, so I would like this um, to get reviewed. And then uh, not only Am I interested in a criteria for stakeholders being added, but also ones to be deleted? If we have um, groups on there that haven't come in three years, then maybe it's time to send them a letter and say, if you're not really, um, you know, involved anymore, we're going to take your, your name off the list, because we do have... Um, okay. And the only thing I was just going to say is, to Ms. Rowe's point, um, maybe I would like to see it reviewed to include written comment so when people are not able to you know get one of those no. spots um, okay. they can still have their comments and that's uh, something that we just started in the pandemic and i think it's something the prc might consider to continue thank All right. you thank you miss causey um it looked like uh dr hager oh i was just wondering if we should make an amendment to the uh motion um based on what miss Pe miss pastor was saying which is a good point that the wording um is a little vague but I don't know if that's ne if that's needed. And and okay. Madam Chair, I, I had suggested an amendment. Um, I put in the chat if I may amend my motion. Ms. Hen, before you do that, Eric Brusade is here. Maybe just to make this a little easier. Yes. The board could the board could vote to refer policy eighty three fifteen to committee and just let them take it from there. I think yeah. that sounds like the best option yes okay um so then how would we well mr Bersides, what do you suggest that we do um to refer to committee would there need to be another motion made yes okay then um i can make the motion that i make well Chair, before you do we yes. need to act on the motion that's on the floor okay 
and I don't know that I'm willing to withdraw it. I would like to amend. I was going to ask if you were going to withdraw it. Um, I believe we need to provide if following Ms. Pasture's spirit and of specificity mm -hmm. in our direction, I would like to provide specific direction to the committee um, okay. by making the motion and, and I suggested an amendment um, in the chat. Okay, I, I would move then that to strike, to add an amendment to strike the language um, and I move that we send um, policy 8315 to the PRC committee. Second. Thank you. Seconded by Mr. Mahamza. So basically, I struck the language from the um, from the um, motion that Ms. Hen made, and and just moved that we send policy eighty three fifteen to the committee. And I feel that we can do deliberation in in committee. Um, so I think my motion and second it speaks for itself. Um, Ms. Gover, can we do a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favor is eight, opposed is four. Okay, so that um, that carries. Okay, so then we will discuss that in committee. Madam Chair, so yes. that, was an, that was an amendment to the motion. Oh, that's... <laughs> so now we need to vote on the motion. Now we can vote on the motion. Okay, thank you for that, my mistake. All right, so now we'll vote on um, the motion that Ms. Hen made. And Ms. Gover... Okay. Can, can we read that Ms. again, please? Ms. Scott, yes. It, it's, the, you, it's the motion that you, your amendment to Ms. Hen's motion. I'm sorry, could you say that again, please, Mr. Bersades? Uh The board is now voting on your amendment to Ms. Hen's motion. My amendment to Ms. Hen's motion. Okay, which is to basically strike the language and send it to committee. Correct. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Cover, if we could do a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rao? Excuse yeah. me, Ms. excuse me. Oh, um, yes, Ms. Causey. Yes, I just wanted to clarify um, because Mr. Brustady's comment didn't make sense to me. We are now voting on Ms. Hen's motion as amended by your language, which to strike um, the... Uh, Basically the to strike of all of the language yes. that she has in there and yes. to send it to committee. Yes, and your motion passed. So... It's Ms. Hen's motion as amended by, by you. Okay. Correct. Thank you. No, thank you for that clarification. Sure. We need as much <laughs> as we can get. Um, Ms. Gover? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yep. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so that carries. So that will be sent to committee. All right. So thank you for that. So the next item is on the agenda is the superintendent's report. For that, I call on Dr. Williams. So good evening, Team BCPS. Uh, for the first time this school year, our first groups of students have returned for in-person hybrid learning at our four public separate day schools and preschool through grade two. During my visits, I have witnessed the joy of reunion between returning students and staff, as well as engaging instruction for students who are in person and learning virtually. Once again, I cannot thank our school leaders, our educators, all of our staff and central office leaders enough for their diligent planning and preparations, which began last summer. We continue to prioritize health and safety by reinforcing mitigation strategies recommended by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. 
In addition, BCPS staff are continuing to be prioritized for COVID-19 vaccine based on our reopening plan and roles with the highest contact with students. The vaccine is available through the Baltimore County Department of Health, as well as statewide sites and other jurisdictions and sources. As I'm sure you know, quantities of this vaccine remain extremely limited. We will offer vaccine registrations to all interested staff in time. Also, Baltimore County Public Schools supports the safe return to athletic competition for student athletes. After continued consultation with staff from the Baltimore County Department of Health, and an intense focus on mitigation strategies, BC, BCPS will allow inner county competition games be, beginning Friday, March 12, 2021. BCPS will continue to partner with the Maryland Department of Health, MSDE, and the Baltimore County Department of Health, sorry, that should read, the Maryland Department of Health, MCPS, MSDE and Baltimore County Department of Health as we monitor health metrics and utilize CDC guidelines to support decision making. To aid and support the safety of our student athletes and staff, we will only allow one spectator per athlete uh, when competition resumes. Information on how spectators can access a ticket will be forthcoming for each school's athletics office. As always, we will continue to monitor the situation and provide updates and more information as necessary. Our long-term recovery from the ransomware attack continues across our system. Families uh, were provided access to report cards as scheduled through our new focus system. Throughout our weekly payroll updates to staff on the internal news hub, we provide information about our continued improvements. W-2s were mailed to staff with 2020 earnings on March 1st. This progress is only possible because of the dedication of our leaders and staff. A few weeks ago, we learned that the BCPS four-year adjusted cohort graduation rate was at 88.5% for the class of 2020, despite the many challenges that our seniors faced during the last school year. We continue to exceed the state's graduation rate. I want to recognize all of our school leaders, our school executive directors, and our community superintendents, as well as our teachers and our students for their efforts to engage and support our seniors as early as first grade or kindergarten all the way through high school. I reported earlier this afternoon, we received more good news recently when the Maryland School Counselor Association, MSCA, selected Jason Barnett, who is the principal of Relay Elementary School as its administrator of the year. The MSCA was also has also selected Dr. Amalio Nueves, who is our executive director of our Department of Social Emotional Support, as it's Dr. Vivian Lee, School Counselor Advocate of the Year. Congratulations to Principal Barnett and Dr. Nueves. This recognition again demonstrates the strong focus on social emotional learning from our leaders. A quick update about our compass. Uh, we continue to work with schools and offices to support school progress plans and office progress plans, including recovery from the ransomware attack. Leaders from across the organization are also creating the Compass walkthrough tool, which will, be used, which will be used by executive leaders during school visits to see the Compass in action. The tool will initially be piloted in schools that are part of the instructional core team, and a formal update will be provided to the board at a later date. And finally, our annual stakeholder survey is now available at www.bcps.org for students in grades 3 to 12 and all parents, caregivers, staff, and community members. We use survey results to inform our budget, staffing, and programs. The survey is available in 16 languages for students, parents, and community members. Please take the survey and encourage your neighbors and friends to do the same. Thank you. That concludes my report. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Williams. And next we have the chair's report. And um, that's me. And um, I just would like to thank everybody who is here with us. Um, we are in a hybrid fashion. Several of us um, are actually in the boardroom, and um, while others are joining us remotely. So um, I thank the 
public and everyone for, for joining us and um, for bearing with us. This is our first hybrid board meeting, um, many more to come, but I look forward to when we will all be able to be here all at the same time, all um, serving um, the students, parents, and stakeholders of, of BCPS. I, I would like to um, welcome our students as, as they're returning. Thank staff for the excellent job that um, they're doing welcoming our students back. And I would just like to say that we're all juggling a lot of things that I think we're managing well. And um, that's pretty much my report. So thank you all very much. Next is the student member of the board, um, Mr. Joshua Mahumza. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair Hen, Superintendent Williams, and members of the public. Yesterday around the world, people celebrated the extraordinary achievements and contributions of women globally. And during this month, we'll continue to commemorate the trailblazers of the past and present. Our work in creating a more just and eco society here and around the world is still ongoing. Just looking around this room and on my computer screen, I see trailblazers in their own right. Our board and school system has been lucky to have smart and highly accomplished women leaders. From our chair, who is the first African-American woman board chair, our vice chair, Ms. Hand, our board, which has a supermajority of women holding seats, our school system, which has a number of women in senior leadership positions, and even had our former superintendent, Ms. White, who is the first woman and only woman of color to hold the position, our executive assistant, Ms. Grover, and the many, many more who I did not mention. All of you have broken glass ceilings. You have all shown every little girl in our schools that they too can be as equally or more accomplished as their male peers. Our, system recognize, our school system recognizes you and thanks you. Last month, I announced that two finalists for the student board member position were selected. I want to congratulate Christian Thomas, junior at Eastern Tech High School, and Logan Duval, junior at Franklin High School. These two are highly accomplished and dedicated uh, students. I had the pleasure this weekend of having a lengthy phone call, uh, phone call with both of them to answer the many questions they had and talk about the potential future of this role. Both have a great understanding of, the, of our school system and the workings of the board, and have campaigned on a number of, issue of uh, and have campaigned, campaigned on a number of issues that they intend to bring to the board next school year if elected. The election will take place next week, Wednesday, March 17th, where every middle schooler and high school uh, student will have an opportunity to vote for either candidate. Their campaigns can also be followed on Instagram, Twitter, and BSPS TV. In the final moments, uh, in the final months of my term, I'm working with, uh, with my team to make sure that the next uh, student board member is in the best position to succeed in their work and be able to uh, effectively accomplish their agenda mm -hmm. while also uh, being able to interact more effectu effectively with students. In my call with our SMOB finalists, both relayed to me the need for the student board member to have more communication and access to students so that they can best succeed in doing the work of the students on the Board of Education. I have continued to listen uh, to similar comments, and I've sought the support of student advisors and staff members who have been very helpful in assisting me in doing this uh, important work. Especially this year with no school visit and no uh, in-person student council meetings and, no, and currently no uh, SMOP page, uh, which was um, removed because of the ransomware, uh, all of this has just exacerbated uh, the challenges the SMOB has, um, has when trying to communicate with our diverse and large student body. Currently, I'm working on increasing my social media presence, creating new forms of communication, vis visiting more schools uh, virtually and in person, and hopefully creating an advisory group so that we can hear, uh, hear from more students, not just those from schools with more uh, access to leadership and extracurricular opportunities. In the coming weeks, I'll also be working with our ELA office in creating a student focus group, which will allow students to get feedback on our current curriculum. This group will be part of the larger audit that, that the ELA uh, office is conducting over the next three years to reform our ELA curriculum to be more culturally responsive. Updates on my work and future initiatives can be found on all of my social media platforms and expect uh, new and exciting things to be announced later this week and subsequent weeks. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Mahomza. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that, I call on Mr. Brusades. Good evening, Madam Chair. Earlier this evening, the board voted to uh, extend the deadline for filing financial disclosure forms for 60 days from April 30th to June 30th. Now would be an appropriate time to confirm that action that was taken earlier this evening. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? So moved, Ms. So Causey. Moved, Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Ms. Pastor. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries. Madam Chair? Yes, Ms. Causey. Related to the motion that just passed, um, would you, I, I, I request that you have staff revise the resolution that was passed last year, the similar one, mm -hmm. um, so that that could be um, certified and published as, as the previous direction was. Okay. Um, yeah, we should be able to do that. Yeah. That was, Thank you. All right. Thank you for that, Ms. Causey. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mercedes. Next, the next item on the agenda is contract awards. And for that, I call on Ms. Jose, Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Earlier today, the Building and Contracts Committee met, and um, we met at a regularly scheduled meeting, and the Building and Contracts Committee recommends approval of contracts 1 through 29. This comes recommended unanimously from the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jose. Do I have a motion to approve items K-1 through K-29? So moved, Hen. Second, Offerman. <laughs> Thank you. Um, no second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Um, is there any discussion? Madam Chair. Ms. Ms. Causey, yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was going to ask that the um, contracts be divided to have the construction uh, documents separated at the end. That's starting with um, Ms. Scott, if I may, um, I could divide it up since I already had it. Um, I would yes. ask contracts be divided uh, from contracts 1 through 5 and contracts 6 through 29, which are capital projects, for ease of discussion. Okay, so we're going to divide them into cohorts. Uh, you said contracts 1 through 5. And, and then six through twenty nine. Yes. Okay. And does that div divide up? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So then, um, let me see. So then, do I have a motion to approve items K one through K five? So moved, Offerman. Thank you. No second is needed since it's coming from the committee. Is there any discussion on items K-1 through K-5? Yes, Madam Chair. Yes. Was that Ms. Causey? Yes. If staff okay. could just briefly um, um, describe those contracts um, for the board before we take a vote, that would be appreciated. Dr. Scriven and Mr. Sayers, please. Yep. Mr. Sayers. Uh, yes, those first five uh, Contracts are all for cohorts uh, to provide uh, professional development for, for teachers seeking to gain uh, either their basic or elevated credentials uh, to uh, meet the uh, recruitment and staffing needs of BCPS. And additionally, some of them 
are also for uh, paraeducators who we are encouraging through our own uh, internal uh, self-growth program uh, to be endorsed as uh, teachers. So uh, it's also an incentive for uh, those folks who are currently uh, paraeducators just to elaborate on what Mr. Sarah shared. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sarris and Dr. Scrivens. So whilst uh, we typically approve cohorts um, at this time of year, some of these programs are new as um, the board and the superintendent work towards um, improvements in our recruitment and retention. Is that fair to say? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Do we have any additional questions on items K-1 through K-5? Okay, hearing none, um, Ms. Scover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Carries. Uh, next, um, do I have a motion to approve items K6 through K29? So moved, Hen. Thank you. No second is needed since it comes from the committee. Any discussion on K6 through K29? Ms. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. I know that in building contracts, these were discussed earlier, but um, many people do not have the opportunity to do that. And there are some um, uh, programs here that uh, if someone from facilities could just run through those um, facility construction contracts, because there are um, some exciting improvements that are gonna be happening for our students and staff and communities. And I think it would just be important to uh, briefly highlight them. Thank you. Mr. Dixit, uh, if you could take the floor at this time, please. Thank you, Dr. Scriven. So uh, quickly, there are some maintenance parts contract for electronic parts and supplies, plumbing supplies. So these are the two regular parts contract. There is one contract for the software package known as school dude to improve the productivity of the uh, facilities management department by giving us a later version of cloud-based software for work order systems for energy management data and things like that. That contract was already approved by the board three years or in 2020. And this is just extending the contract for the next three years. So that was the software contract. Then there are some systemic projects that are for Millbrook Elementary School roof, Northwest Academy serving line and kitchen re renovations, Orem's Elementary School parking lot improvements, Pikesville Middle School serving line and kitchen. These are systemic projects already approved by the board under the capital improvement program. There was a grant project for Franklin High School for concession stand and emergency access to fields. And that was as part of a grant that was made available to us by Delegate Jones. And finally, there were a series of 15 contracts for construction of a new school in the northeast part of the county, which is Northeast Elementary School at Ridge Road. And the project is going to start sometimes early this summer and targeted to be completed for opening in August 2022. Any questions? Thank you for that. Mr. Sears, what would, um, so there's hope then for an in-person groundbreaking perhaps this summer. I'm looking at Dr. Williams. <laughs> 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 There's hope. Thank you. Yes, thank you for going through that. Um, those those are very exciting things to hear about. So, yeah. Okay. Um, Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. 
Ms. Clausey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahumsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, and the motion carries. All right. And the next item on the agenda is the reopening of schools. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott and members of the board. Uh, this evening, we will provide a brief update on the reopening. Members of our design team are present here tonight to provide additional information and to answer questions. Next slide, please. Thank you, thank you. Last week, we opened our doors for students in our public separate day schools and students in our preschool through grade two. Looking at the pictures, you can see this was an exciting week for our students, families, and, and especially our staff. This has been a true collaborative effort between staff across our divisions and staff in our schools. As I shared Earlier, I must express my gratitude to the school-based staff, administrators, teachers, support professionals, and building service workers. Our schools were ready to welcome students back in a safe and secure environment. Schools look differently. Outside, there are guides to help students walk six feet apart while they are entering the building. Our hallways are full of signs to assist our staff and students with remembering our mitigation strategies. There are markers on the floors and the hallways that help students understand which side of the hallway to walk on, which stairwell to use, and how to remain six feet apart. Our classrooms look differently as well. Students have been provided with ample space to keep their belongings and learning materials near them. They also spent time last week learning routines and procedures to assist with the implementation of strategies such as hand washing and use of classroom materials. Learning looks differently too. Sometimes students engage with work at their desks, while other times they see their friends in the opposite cohort who are learning from home. The installation of web, cam web cams has assisted teachers with teaching those students in front of them while engaging the students learning virtually. Students are able to attend their special classes. Thanks to our staff and food services, they are able to eat breakfast and lunch in either their classrooms or the cafeteria. Our students also have a chance to get outside and enjoy recess. In general, buses have been arriving on time and delivering out students in a safe manner. Thanks to our staff and transportation for their work in ensuring students are safely distanced and that our buses are clean in between runs. I would like to thank all of our families as, as we welcome back our students, our parents that were very supportive and following all of the mitigation strategies and helping to create a positive atmosphere at all schools. I also would like to thank several board members for joining me as I visited schools uh, to welcome our students and to see the actual learning take place. So thank you, board members. Next slide. So we want to take a moment and just review some of our PPE and uh, mitigation uh, provisions which we've made uh, for all schools. Uh, PPE is defined by OSHA as specialized clothing or equipment worn by an employee for protection against infectious materials. We've worked hand in hand with our health department under the leadership of Deb Somerville uh, and BCPS purchased all required PPE for staff as follows, uh, medical grade masks, gowns, gloves, face shields, and face masks for students and staff whose personal face covering 
uh, potentially were forgotten or sold. Additionally, uh, we were fortunate to have uh, county government and our CE uh, use CARES grant, <clears throat> which specifically enhanced and supported uh, supplies of mitigation and provided additional items such as electronic cleaning wipes uh, for devices in all of our classrooms, hand sanitizer, air purifiers, plexiglass, and PPE items over and beyond uh, what we initially purchased for uh, BCPS internally. All schools have received the internal uh, PPE uh, supplies, and there are only 16 schools that are going to be receiving the remaining uh, county government mitigation and PPE supplies, and those deliveries will be completed this Friday on March 12th. Next slide, please. Yes, so good evening. Uh, uh, this is Mary. And um, just as an athletics update, as all of you are aware, and I know Dr. Williams shared earlier in his superintendent's report, we will be resuming uh, games uh, within um, the fall season uh, starting this Friday. Um, likewise, we will be providing um, one spectator per athlete uh, with a non-touch ticketing system. Um, Mr. Sai will be meeting with our athletic directors tomorrow, going over some of the details around the ticketing process. Um, and then last but not least, we are in the process of planning and standing up tutoring supports uh, for all of our athletes that um, may need that to make sure that they are in good order for next fall season, um, which we know will be starting in August. So that really concludes our athletics update for this um, board meeting. And I think if we could go to the next slide, I think that one's mine as well. Yes, so in addition, we want to um, highlight for everyone this evening some of the additional wraparound supports that we're providing um, to support uh, instruction and academic achievement. So as we move further into the spring, we will be um, organizing and providing tutoring supports for our students, um, providing some Saturday supports as well as um, middle school STEM and literacy supports um, to extend in-person learning. Throughout the summer, as always, we will be offering summer programs. Um, those programs right now, we are planning for in-person programming, as well as continuing to offer virtual programming for families who feel like that's the right choice for their, their child. Um, and we will um, continue to provide a self-paced virtual program as well. In future curriculum committees, I'll make sure that I provide a, a full presentation around the uh, seven different programs that we will be running throughout the summer. And then certainly as we move into next fall, we will continue to provide these wraparound instructional supports in the form of tutoring, Saturday and after school um, supports as well, just to give you a highlight of how everything's coming together. So this concludes my portion of the presentation this evening. Thank you. And at this time, I'll turn it back over to Chairwoman Scott. Thank you for that. Uh, looks like we have some questions from some board members. Um, first is from Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I don't have a question, but I just want to take a quick moment to thank Dr. Williams and the teachers, the custodians, principals, and school staff, and central office staff that have reopened our schools safely this week. In addition to this, you know, BCPS has continued to serve over 4 million meals to our children. So a lot has been doing uh, going on. And I want to take a minute to say thank you, Dr. Williams and all um, staff. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ms. Jo. So next we have Mr. Offerman. Yes, I was wondering if there's any data about what percent of the eligible students have chosen either the either uh, any of the uh, in-person programs available. So thank you, Mr. Offerman. I will ask the design team to provide some specifics 
when we looked at the different cohorts, it was ranging in terms of the survey, in terms of the numbers or percentages were ranging anywhere from 40 to 50 percent. Um, Ms. Byers, would you give some more additional information or Dr. Jones or Dr. Roberts in terms of what's happening at the school level? Thank you. Sure, thank you, Dr. Williams, and good evening, everyone. Um, what Dr. Williams said is accurate in that um, when you look in the aggregate as a school system, we're looking at about 30% uh, of our students have chosen in-person hybrid learning. Um, when you drill down to the school level, and I don't have that data in front of me, but um, you do see variants across schools. So some schools um, may be closer to 70, 75%. Um, where other schools may be at lower percentages, um, below 30, uh, more around 20, 25 percent. So, Dr. Roberts, Dr. Jones, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add uh, to that. Yep, that's good. Thank you, Ms. Spires. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank Mr. You. Offerman. Uh, I have a second question. Uh, uh, I was wondering if there will be any attempt to reschedule any of the sports contest missed because of the... Uh, of the delayed fall season. I'm sorry, Mr. Offman, could you repeat that? I, my computer paused out for a moment. No problem. I was wondering if there's going to be any attempt made to make up any of the sports contests missed by the uh, by the uh, by the uh, delay. Right. Thank you. So, Mr. Offman, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Sai. I believe he's on the meeting with us. If you could um, provide any comment for that, Mr. Sai, because I wouldn't want to speak uh, to the level of detail that you can. Not a problem. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, at this particular time, Mr. Offerman, um, we have no plans on making up any of the events that uh, we missed last week. Um, currently, um, we're um, dealing with issues in terms of the same things I talked about in meetings before as it relates to security at events, um, official groups, transportation, and the such as it relates to the, the impact of the pandemic. So at this particular time, uh, we, we reached out to our golf program courses, which allow us to be on the course on the courses. Uh, they don't have any more open dates for us to use to reschedule anything. And then we also, um, again, as I mentioned, some of the other challenges that we're faced. So we're going to start with the 12th and just move forward from there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Next, looks like we have Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, my first question is for Dr. McComas. You stated that you were going to give us, I think, a uh, more in-depth um, presentation about summer school offerings. Is, is that going to be at our next meeting? Well, I can certainly work with Dr. Williams to find out when he'd like me to have that for the full board. I was certainly going to build that into our curriculum committee. Every year we do provide an overview to the curriculum committee of the programs that we run each year, what each program is for. So for example, we have our extended school year program for students with disabilities. We have our program for our English language learners. We have programs for students in Title I schools. And so I, don't, I won't belabor that point this evening, but we can certainly um, you know, I can work with Dr. Williams to find out when best to provide that. Um, in addition, I can provide um, our presentation and curriculum committee in the spring, as I always do as well. Okay, thank you. I would I would follow up with that to say that um, I'm hopeful that we're able to provide offerings to uh, as many people that are willing to take them in person, especially with um, uh, all the time in this hybrid model. I'm, I'm concerned and I would like to understand how we are going to assess children's progress as to where they are immediately and where we need to get to them to before they are promoted to the next grade. Right. So I can, if, if it's okay, Dr. Williams, I'll just elaborate for just a moment on that um, without taking too much time this evening. So it's important, Mr. Kuhn, and thank you for that, because what's important to understand is that we have been continuing unit by unit to um, use diagnostic assessments at the beginning of, or diagnostic tasks, if you will, at the beginning of each unit, whereby we identify what are those critical prerequisites, skills, and standards, and knowledge 
that students have going into each unit. So it helps us to identify how to accelerate the learning. Um, so it's important that everyone understand it's not that we have not been continuing to monitor and work on student learning. I think that, you know, um, it's important that people understand that it, the work here is really identifying those critical paths and accelerating students. Um, and that that doesn't occur sim just in a standardized testing format, that that occurs in um, pre and, and um, pre-unit uh, diagnostic tasks where we get to see exactly what students know and can do. So I'll, I'll talk more about that uh, in other ways. I know, Mr. Kuhn, you, you love instruction, science of teaching and learning. I know you talked about earlier, so I appreciate that. Um, and I uh, appreciate everyone understanding that this is ongoing uh, work. And I'll elaborate more in those, uh, those presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to my second set of questions. Uh, Ms. Byers, you spoke specifically to uh, an aggregate of about 30% of people across or children across the system coming back. Um, do you have the breakouts by, um, uh, by the various areas that you can share? So I don't have them in front of me right now, Mr. Kuhn, so I'd be happy to work with Dr. Williams in terms of getting uh, you and the full board uh, that information. I do just want to add that that's reflective of the initial, um, I shouldn't say the initial, the questionnaire that was sent out systemically. As the board is aware, um, we every school's website has a form on the home page that parents and families may access um, if they want to switch from a, a fully virtual cohort to an in-person hybrid cohort. And they can do that at any time. And then there are dates, we call them on-ramping dates, um, when schools notify families this would be the start date for your student. And so it, it does fluctuate, it is changing because we have afforded our families um, a way that allows them in an ongoing way to opt into in-person learning. Just to follow on, what you're telling me is um, that you don't actually know the numbers off the top of your head and that people can t continue to request to go in person up until what point or just ongoing? Ongoing until the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So there, there are windows. Um, so for example, if you were to access the form um, and if you go to a school website, the dates are, are visible, it's very transparent, it's on the form, it's on the website. Um, but within a window, when you fill out the form, you're then given a corresponding start date for your student. And that will take place through the end of the year. Thank you. Um, my last set of questions are for Mr. Sai. Thank you for joining. One of um, what you just mentioned was we, we lost a week of competition across the system. Can you put that in perspective as to the number of games that the average football team is going to have missed? Is that one or two games? Or what are we looking at? You're looking at one game, sir. Uh, Which and, the fifth. and that's across all sports? Um, fairly much. There might be some sports that may have missed two. Um, may have missed two, but um, one for football and maybe as many as two for any other sport. But I don't think that's many schools. Most of them are just one, one game. Thank but you. there probably are a few that had two, but not many. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Mahomza. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. McComas, earlier you m mentioned um, the new tutoring program. I, I believe you said that you your team is working on um, yeah. to have available for athletes. Um, I'm wondering, is th would this be a required thing for those um, athletes that benefited from the academic eligibility waiver? Um, yeah, could you answer that first? 
Yes, sir. So that, that would certainly be a, a target group of athletes that we want to make sure that we're serving in this program. Um, in terms of, you know, if there's other athletes who could benefit from this, we certainly would not turn down. You know, we want all of our athletes to really um, certainly by August 15th or this the start of our fall season in, in August, we want all our athletes who um, want to participate in fall sports to be eligible at our normal standard. And so, you know, the goal is to support all our athletes, but certainly those who, you know, are um, amended um, eligibility requirement. We want to make sure that they um, are they're on the team now, they're motivated, that we support them in that process, and we help them to continue to soar, so. Okay. Um so they're not required is that the plan well i i think what we would work with them i mean i i it'd be hard i'd be hard pressed to find an athlete who they've been given an opportunity to participate at this current criteria mm. i'm sure they're motivated to want to participate in the fall so we would certainly work with them around what what might be ho wanting them holding back from participating in a resource support okay um okay my next question is um do you have an update on uh, graduations, uh, kind of their activities, and um, final examinations for seniors? So I'm going to ask Dr. Zarchin, I believe, can speak to, or maybe the community superintendents can speak to the graduations. And um, exams, would we would have our normal uh, process around exams as you get to the end of the semester. Oh, sorry, quick, before they go, so it's not going to be like last year, I believe. Last year, we didn't have any, or did we? Well, no, because last year was a completely sort of altered situation. Yeah. Um, we are ha scheduled to have final exams as normal. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So I can, um, so good evening, Mr. Mahomes. So I can address the senior activities and um, Dr. Zarchin's team can address graduations. For senior activities, we're working currently, um, community superintendents with our executive directors are working with principals um, to gather information with respect to some ideas that they have right now with senior activities um, in order to provide guidance to schools. So that is actively being worked on and our goal is to have some guidance out to principals um, in order to share with the community around senior activities. Hey, thank you. And speaking of graduation, at this point, we are planning for modified in-person graduation ceremonies, information regarding the proposed venues, details about health and safety protocols, and other details uh, will be forthcoming. With what we know about COVID right now, right now, the mitigation practices, we're recommending that we hold the ceremonies outdoors uh, at individual schools, However, we are still working through uh, details and plans regarding graduation. Um, yeah, so a uh, quick follow-up on that. Would it, I guess for this year, since it is gonna be, um, we are gonna have to follow strict protocols. It would, is the county gonna take lead on this, um, basically uh, putting in place some requirements or, or is it just going to be um, just the COVID um, um, uh, recommendations and allow allowing the schools um, to go from there, because usually, like I, I believe, they would do all the planning and all that. So we will be working with the county. Um, as you know, the good news is even today, you know, the governor has opened things up um, a, a little more. Effective Friday. Uh, the county has opened things up and we, we're hoping that that will continue as our numbers improve. Um, we have folks uh, working with schools to get feedback and plan those graduation uh, opportunities. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Ms. Mack. Uh, thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I believe my question is for Dr. McComas, but anybody can answer it. Um, a principal once shared with me that the most successful and well attended extended year learning that ever occurred at this principal school was when grant money was used to provide multiple week, full day, nine to four at least, opportunities that concentrated on academic supports in the morning and learning through play opportunities in the afternoon. 
Um, I was told that the full day allowed parents to work um, and it allowed children um, to be stimulated through both learning and play. So my question is, um, have we considered or can we use CARES funds to provide a more robust summer offering for students um, who need that offering and and make it such that it would be more palatable for um, parents and more parents would want to send their students. So, Ms. Mack, I will I'll go ahead and thank you for that beautiful quote, uh, sharing what the principal will share with you, because I certainly and I, uh, you know, as a working mother myself, I certainly understand the point. Um, we have the team has been working uh, to look at how to optimize uh, summer programs uh, this year, particularly in light of of the the how COVID has altered everything for us. Um, my general sort of charge for the team, if you will, was to, um, you know, essentially build programs so that we could have a continuous bridge from this school year to next school year. And part of that uh, work, the team has really looked at the length of the, of the school programs. You know, we do have um, the benefit of, you know, CARES funding and things of that nature that is, um, you know, not in a typical school year. So um, I will say, yes, Ms. Mack, we have been exploring those. We certainly do recognize uh, making summer programming in a way that works for families, um, meaning that sort of full day experience is important. Part of what we do traditionally do with our Title I funds um, is provide some matching services. We also do that with our, our ELL program where we, we use um, Soccer Without Borders as part of a social emotional piece to pair with the academic piece. So um, again, when we bring forward our presentation, uh, we'll have all of that in detail for you. But I do appreciate you bringing that forward because we do recognize, you know, we need to we need to create programming that is um, sort of a total package, if you will, is what I hear. You, and you just to provide yeah. a little specificity, I was advised that when the full day offering was made, they had to cap it at 100 students when in previous years they couldn't even really make kids come to extend it your learning so i appreciate you listening to the question and i look forward to what you bring back thank you my pleasure thank you thank you next dr hager um yes thank you um so I was just re-looking back at our uh, reopening plan, and it seems to end at phase four, which is really exciting. My kids are going back phase four. They're over the moon about it. Um, but we still have over three months left in the school year. So I have a few questions about kind of what happens next. So once we go to hybrid uh, reopening for all students, assuming the metrics continue to improve, what needs to happen to expand beyond where we will be on for phase four? So we heard a lot about uh, from public comment about the possibility of going four, day, four days for some students. Is there a plan to make that happen? We heard about recess and playground access and concerns about kids being able to play freely. What needs to happen to make that happen? Where do we need to be with the metrics? What's in place to make that happen? Um, having only one spectator at, at athletic games has been a big conversation. Again, what needs to change to allow more than one spectator? And then last, um, I have been really interested in the three feet versus six feet distance as far as kind of the literature goes and CDC is sticking with six feet for now. Every time I see a new, um, a new metric, I do a fine to see if they change it to three feet, but for the, at this point, they're still sticking with six feet. But assuming that the science catches up and they change to three feet, are we prepared for that as well? So basically, what's the next step is what I'm asking. So I'll start. I think, thank you for those questions. Um, we have been following the CDC guidelines and there's a lot of, of conversation around the social distancing. I think to your point, uh, what the design team has decided and what we have looked at and planned for is this phase in. Now, as we get to all four groups, then we want to continue to look at um, what will our cohorts look like because just this week, we, we started to see more inquiries about, well, I, the parents may have selected cohort C. Now they're thinking about, well, I want to look at some other options. I think we have to continue to look at that flexibility. And as we see the guidelines from CDC are starting to provide a little bit more clarity or in, in changing. And so that was the, the direction that I shared with um, Mary McComas and her team. Let's start thinking about 
what we have now and start planning Saturday school uh, tutorials for our athletes and then start building that through the summer. We're still watching the CDC guidelines. We're still having the conversations uh, with our Baltimore County Health Department to guide us around our decision. So uh, we want to be fluid and we're going to continue. Right now we're, we're looking at all of the planning that takes place to bring back a group of students as we cohort them, looking at the transportation, looking at uh, meals and services, as well as our staff. Uh, so uh, I, I think we're going to be making some modifications as we go along. Hopefully we'll continue to see better metrics. Um, but that was the whole thinking about let's look at a, a unique plan from the spring all the way to the start of the school year. And we're going to be looking at what's working and what's not and making some modifications as we go. So just to follow up, so is there a specific plan for an updated reopening plan in place or is it just kind of a... I, I know things change are changing constantly. So are you just meeting frequently to re you know, review what you have in place or kind of what's the process? So we're still reviewing each each week. The design team um, will provide updates. So I think it's ongoing. Uh, we still have a COVID-19 task force where we have our staff meeting with representatives. We don't have a, a date. I heard the comments from the public comments today. I think we just have to look at, let's get through our phase and then re-examine where we are as, as a district. Um, and, and again, I, I found it so worthwhile working with our partners. And thank you for your recommendation where we reached out to a representative from CDC. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ms. Jose. Thank you. Um, Dr. Williams or Dr. McComas, if you could answer this, for the summer school program that is evolving and you're going to, you know, uh, make it better for this year, is that free for children that qualify for free and reduced meals? And if we were to, ex this year you probably have a lot more children that would be qualified for summer school. What would be the fiscal impact of expanding it out to all children? Um, and the second part of the question, Dr. Williams, you shared some of the um, numbers, the, the, the cohort numbers that came back the first week, but I understand that is the first week and those numbers will be evolving and changing as we go through. So there might be a hesitancy on sharing that as you know you, you come to a uh, more robust number, but is that something that would be shareable or is that something we're going to work and see for the next couple of weeks as kids come back and you know not come back or go back? Um, that was my question. Thank you. So, um, Dr. Williams, is there, if it's all right, I will go first and try to address the uh, summer school question. And Ms. Jose, I just need to apologize for a moment. My internet went out, so I think I got all of your questions. So if I miss a piece, please just let me know. Um, in terms of the summer programming, it is free for all the students that participate, uh, regardless of if they qualify for uh, free and reduced meals or not. Um, and just to, to give you a highlight, we are anticipating right now to serve at least um, around 17,800 students in our seven summer programs. And that doesn't include the sort of self-paced uh, program that we offered new last year, which was um, highly participated in um, from students. So the, the self-paced program last year, we had 52,000 students access it throughout the summer. Um, and so um, we're looking at um, trying to provide as much, you know, if you will, blanket coverage um, as possible uh, for our students. And um, so forgive me if I miss any part of the, the summer school question. No, you answered that. And you said 17,800 is what you're expecting back this summer? Okay. Yes, and that would be the um, in-person uh, programming that we're talking about. Uh, one of the new programs that we're adding this year, uh, thanks to a state grant, is our Bridge to Kindergarten, uh, which would be serving um, students entering kindergarten in Title I schools. Uh, that, for example, we're expecting approximately 1,600 students that will be able to serve in that program alone. So uh, we are excited about uh, what we'll you know, uh, what we're building for the summer learning supports. Thank you, Dr. McCombs. Thank you so much, Ms. Jose. And Ms. Jose, um, 
it was raised by Ms. Byers that we, we don't have the numbers tonight, but we can provide that to the board and we can build that into a future presentation as we come back and talk about reopening. Yes, that, that's totally fine, Dr. Williams. I understand that it's going to be an evolving living number as you go through the next couple of weeks, so I, I don't need it right away. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. Jones. I was just going to add, it might be helpful if we look at those um, sort of on-ramp dates because um, we allow families to request to use that form to request a switch to in-person learning all throughout the window. And so the data is fluctuating throughout the window, um, but then at the end of that window, when we have the, the corresponding return date, um, that's more of an exact number. Yeah, got it, thank you. Thank you, next we have Ms. Rowe. Hi, yes, thank you. I just had um, a couple questions. The first is, as a school system, are we doing anything to help assist teachers who are still attempting to get a vaccine to do that? Dr. Zarchin? Yes, so we are um, still working with the Department of Health. I am pleased uh, to share that it, this, this past Sunday, we had approximately, just not quite 900, but just shy of 900 um, BCPS educators who were able to get a vaccine. Um, and prior to that, we've, we've shared links um, in coordination with the Baltimore County Department of Health to approximately 3,000 other Baltimore County employees. Okay, and my other question, I think this might be for Mary McComas, I'm not, I'm not really sure though, is what are we doing when children come back in the fall if their parents really feel that the children should be retained a grade? And how are we going to assess children for that situation? Because the pandemic has created a situation where there may be parents who feel that for whatever reason this year was just lost on their kids. And what, how are we gonna handle that? Right, so thank you, Ms. Ray. That's, a, that's an important question. So we will be following our normal um, process related to um, promotion and retention. So we're not, we have not altered what that process is involved. I think, you know, that's, that's a conversation that needs to happen. Um, for each child, I, I couldn't here in a board meeting make a blanket decision about those particular uh, families and their needs and, and their child's needs. But what I would say um, is it's important, regardless of whether a child um, is promoted or retained, that um, our classroom teachers and our schools really um, commit very fully to what really should be data-driven instructional decision-making, right? Um, at the beginning of every unit of learning, we really need to clearly diagnose where students are in terms of those, again, those prerequisite skills and knowledge, um, and, and where does that align to the standard, and so that we can identify really what is that critical path for each student. And that's important every year, but in light of the pandemic, it's going to be even more important that we have those data-driven processes operational within classrooms and within grade level teams. It's often that teachers work in teams around um, student data and how they're performing so that we can identify what are those uh, learning tasks and those instructional methods that best match to, to help move a student forward. So rather that's work in a small group uh, where a teacher is really customizing the work or if that's um, additional practice opportunities. Um, it's really gonna take um, real commitment to that data-driven process, regardless of if a child is promoted or is retained uh, to be genuine, Ms. Rao. So you're not, you don't have concerns then that the pandemic will create a situation where we're differentiating too many grade levels in one room? I mean, we already differentiate up to four grade levels in one room. I'm just concerned that if you have a pandemic that has held children back in some cases, there might be some kids that could easily be a year behind. And if they were already behind before, as so many of our students are, uh, are we gonna add staff to the room to help teachers differentiate this? I'm just, 
I'm not seeing a situation that was barely tenable before the pandemic as becoming more tenable after. Right. So, I, Ms. Rowe, I understand what you're saying, and I and I think what um, it's important to understand is that the it doesn't change the methods of instruction. What it changes is what are the materials you're using for instruction. Um, and so that's really what the, the difference is, the methodology is, and it's really about the materials that you're using to help. So for materials, are we going to put more people in the classroom to help the kids with those materials, more reading specialists? I guess I'm looking for it concretely, what are we going to do? Because at the end of the day, a teacher has X amount of hours in a classroom with X number of students. And we're going to come back in the fall with a situation. And that situation isn't necessarily going to be um, helped by just do the same thing we've always done. I want to know what we're going to do extra. Well, okay, so I can understand your question when you're talking about extra. First, I would say in terms of staffing, Ms. Rowe, I'll take all the extra staffing that we can get uh, to support. And so if, if we end up... Um, you know, at the end of the budget process or uh, whatever the method is to, to get additional staffing, I just want you to know I'd be happy to put them to good use. Um, you know, when we talk about extra, that is part of those wraparound services. When we talk about tutoring, when we talk about Saturday supports, when we talk about enrichment programming, you know, and, and I would say that when we talk about doing things differently um, than what we have been doing, this is really where that process of grade level planning comes in because when we talk about identifying groupings of students that are getting truly tailored and customized instruction, right? That I that is specific with materials, that's specific with their their standards that they're particularly working on, that that's going to take a great deal of attention. And that's where when you, we talk about we can't do business as usual, that's really where the um the, the effort has to be. I look forward to that year's math testing. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Next Ms. Is... Rowe, I'll say this. Oh. Maybe we can have you visit schools in the fall so I can like sort of show you in real time. So I appreciate you, though. Thank you. I just want to see our scores pick up. Uh, our scores are terrible. I want to see kids who can read by third grade. Because there are municipalities who plan prison populations 10 years in the future. Okay. Grade reading <laughs> Time is real. Thank you. Um, it's next just is. going to get worse. Excuse me. Okay. Next is Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we've spent a lot of time discussing athletics and bringing our student athletes back for good reason. We know how important those activities are to our student athletes. I'm concerned about students involved in other activities, our dance students, our theater, our art, our music, our STEM students. What specific steps are we doing to bring back small groups of those students um, for in-person participation? I know we're prioritizing in-person instruction, but these activities are just as important to these students as um, sports are to our student athletes. So I'd like to know what we're doing and what our plans are to bring them back. Thank you. Can I have someone from the design team to respond to that, Dr. Roberts, Ms. Byers, uh, Dr. Absolutely. Jones? Thank you, Dr. Williams. So, Ms. Henry, with regarding EDA, so first EDAs are still continuing, um, certainly in a virtual environment. Part of the phase and approach would also apply once we get into our phase force, once we come back from spring break. As mentioned earlier, continually monitoring um, the metrics, continuing to monitor um, all the mitigations and safety strategies within our schools. Then at that point, again, as we continually look forward, the actual implementation of in-person, so what you were mentioning, in-person EDAs or the extra duty activities from student council to all the kids that would typically meet after school. Um, but again, in this phased approach, we want to start with bringing our kids back for instruction. And then as our kids come back, and as mentioned earlier, as we have more of our cohort C students coming in, Again, integrating those students into instruction as our priority, as you just mentioned. But then once we have that rhythm in place, then also looking at how we can integrate the EDAs for in-person. So it really is an all-encompassing phase in approach in making sure we're always maintaining our safety mitigations and strategies. So thank you, Dr. Roberts. So I understand how um, 
what I believe you're saying is that those are tied to the return in phase four. However, our student athletes are still participating. Um, many of these activities can be done outdoors. I'm hearing from parents that they are happening, um, not sanctioned, of course, but the, these students need this activity. They, they can't wait. Um, have we thought about this and, and bringing them back sooner to participate in these activities rather than wait until they're, they're fully back? Well, at this point, Ms. Hen, we certainly want to continue with our plan and implementing our plan um, as we've shared with community and shared with staff and so forth. So we really do want to make sure that we adhere to that plan. Certainly, as again, as previously mentioned, as a design team, we do meet weekly um, and we certainly can take that topic back to the design team. But again, we want to make sure that we're being faithful to the plan really using that safety mitigation for indoor, particularly indoor, though some may be able to be held outdoors. Um, certainly the majority of those should be held indoors. We want to make sure that we're maintaining our mitigation um, to the county and to the state. Well, I, I want to make sure we're thinking creatively because it's an issue of equity. If we're affording opportunities to student athletes for in-person activities that we're not affording to our other students, that's, an, that's a concern of equity for me and how these, these students are being um, failed because they're not given the same opportunities they, they rely on their interaction for social and emotional um, health as much as our athletes do. So I, I would like to hear at our next meeting what the specific plans are for bringing them back. And I don't see that we, why we're treating these students because of their, their activity preferences differently than, than our athletes and not prioritizing them. Because even though that's been a focus um, of the board discussion as of late, I, I believe we would be in agreement that these students require as much time and attention as as our athletes. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Ms. Uh, Scott, may, may I just respond? Thank oh, you. yes. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Uh, going back to what Dr. Roberts said, that the activities being sanctioned on school property or in, in the school building, it makes sense to have it in the phase in as we're bringing back additional students, but we have to have the staff to actually run these extracurricular activities. And so as I think it was Dr. Hager that raised about the plans, next steps, we, we, we can look at that as Dr. Roberts mentioned, um, but we have to have the sponsors to actually sponsor these activities. And if I recall from Dr. Zarchin, uh, when he presented the last time, just some of the feedback or, or the, the latest guidance uh, from CDC guidelines was around uh, let's focus on the instruction before we focus on the extracurricular and and athletics. Um, so we'll be happy to circle back and provide an update on this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. It looks like next we have Dr. Hager. Madam Chair, may I ask a follow-up of Dr. Williams in response well, to his comment? Please? Well, no, because your time, your, your, your two minutes is up and it looks like we still have several people who have questions. So I want to make sure that we get to everybody equally. Um, so next is Dr. Hager. And I actually had a very similar line of questioning, so maybe I'll ask your question, Ms. Hen. Um, so I, I was going to ask if there were specific clubs that are not allowed to meet right now, like music or theater, or if there's, or if there's some, because I know that some are meeting virtually. And then I heard the, um, I, I apologize, uh, the person who just said that there's they're planning for uh, these clubs to start after phase four, but is there an actual plan in place? So like, is, is there, you know, a week after high school students come back, then X club will start. Um, is that sort of thing starting to be written down? Um, and I, I actually, my equity lens is more about um, when things are forced underground, that's when we end up having a bigger equity issue. So having it kind of okay. for, front, forefront would be a good thing. Thank you. Did you want to respond to that, Dr. Williams, or staff, or is there a response? Again, I think we can provide some updates as we move forward, as Dr. Roberts and members of the design team reference. We'll be happy to follow up. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Lisa Mack. I have a very quick question, a follow-up question to the conversation that Ms. Rowe had with Dr. McComas. Dr. McComas, can you please confirm for me that at the end of the day, it is up to a parent whether or not the parent wants a child retained? Uh, 
Uh, Miss Mack, I, I only got part of what you said. I'm having a lot of in and out. That's so okay. I'll say I, it again. Um, it, retention, based on the I conversation know. that you had with Miss Rowe, um, I know our efforts would always be to differentiate, to meet our students' needs, um, to do what we need to do. But at the end of the day, can you please confirm that it is the final say of whether a child moves forward or is retained is up to the parent? No, I, I cannot confirm that. It, I, we have to follow the retention um, policy and practice. So there is a there is a whole process to that, Miss Max. So um, that's and we have not changed our process. Okay, so I'll, I'll take a look at that. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Next, it looks like we have a question from Miss Pastor. Yes, very, just very quickly, um, back on um, Ms. Hen and, and Dr. Hager's point, um, I just want to point out that very often the children who are in those programs are fewer in number than the children who are on teams, and it is every bit as critical um, for their social-emotional. But I also know as an arts person that very often we are not thought of on that first rung. And so I know you're going to take that seriously, and I look forward to hearing um, your thoughts about how we're going to move forward with the arts and the other EDAs the, the, um, at our next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. Uh, next, we have Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, um, on <clears throat> on uh, February 26, I sent a um, seven-page email to Dr. Williams and team as requested as a follow-up from the February 23rd board meeting around issues of reopening, um, some that had gone back to um, October. So I'm not going to read everything that I'm going to uh, that I've had in here, but I'm just going to highlight um, the issues. And I would like um, s some explanation and where we are. And in terms of other board members that have had questions, there still seems to be a lot of open-endedness. And 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 let me start with really saying the metrics are improving, the vaccines are increasing, and time is running out for our students this year, especially seniors. So I understand we're working towards summer and we're working towards other things, but there are things that are running out now. Um, graduations, Mr. Dr. Zarshan, could you speak to the time frame? I had sent in here information about the time frame, hoping that it was not moved up so that our seniors would have the opportunity, um, have a greater opportunity in person activities and instruction. So Ms. so, Ms. Causey, um, we will be providing the, some updates based on those questions that you provided. Uh, Dr. Zarchin, uh, any additional information you want to provide regarding graduation? No, I shared information earlier. Um, as far as the time frame, uh, we're looking at between May 18th um, right through June uh, 7th. Is, is the, the general time frame for graduations. So that's earlier than it is typically, and we started this school year the latest, and we also lost three days to the ransom attack. So what's the rationale behind that? Well, Dr. Zarchin gave a time frame. Again, the team is still looking at how to look at the, all the logistics if we're going to do any outside graduation. So at this point, um, we will look within that frame of that window, um, but be mindful. So I understand your point about the cyber attack. I understand about our seniors. Um, it's usually when May comes as a former high school principal, uh, seniors are counting down how many days they have left. But again, we, we're working within a time frame and we'll continue um, to finalize those plans as well as work with our high school principals and then we'll be able to provide an update. 
Thank you for so, that. Oh, sorry. Um, well, so that's interesting because I've heard from parents that their schools are sending out their graduation date already. So, again, there needs to be um, communication that's effective. And if the board has um, discussion that it would like to have about the dates, I mean, I, I hear my other board members are out of their time, um, but it, that, that does not make sense to me. Um, <clears throat> The other thing I requested is that all of the questions be put on the website and the answers be put on the website. Okay. Um, so Thank at you. this point, I want to make a motion. Your that time is up, though, Ms. Clausey. I understand that. Uh, but that doesn't, that, that's my speaking time. That's not time to make yeah, a motion. Yeah, the time is two minutes total. But it will make an exception if you'd like to make your motion, oh, please. It, it's not an exception because other people have done it. So thank you. So, I'll so make I'm going to make a motion that uh, the. Dr. Williams and staff bring back the plan for instituting extracurricular activities, uh, which can include, well, <clears throat> at the next meeting, let me just say that. Could you put it in the chat, please? I certainly will. Thank you. Um, did you make your motion, though? I nope, didn't hear I'm you state it. it. Okay. I'm going to type it in. Madam Chair, okay, I, I is, would just say we're yeah. happy to follow back at our next meeting to provide some updates around EDAs or extracurricular activities. So does it really require a motion then if we, it's something that we can just direct you to bring to us at our next board meeting? Um, you Ms. cannot Causey? direct the superintendent unless the full board votes on it. Okay. Well... What is it exactly? Because I'm, I'm still confused with what the motion is. I'm not sure really what you're asking. Okay, so this is really taking up the assembly's time. So thank so. you. Yes, I think it's important a number of people have touched on it. Uh, I make a motion that Dr. Williams bring a plan to institute extracurriculars at the next meeting. Is there a second? Okay, second. so hearing none, we can second. move on. Second. Was there a second? Okay. Mr. Kuhn also so, second. Okay, I'm not sure who did the second first, um, but the motion was made by Ms. Causey uh, that Dr. Williams bring a plan to institute extracurriculars at the next meeting, and that was seconded by, I believe, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Yeah. May I speak to my... Motion, Madam Chair. You have not already spoke to your motion? No. I just have. I thought you just did speak to it. Um, yes, briefly, please, because we still have more items to get to and we are running out of time. <laughs> well, our children are running out of time, and I yes. certainly understand. Um, no, no, so sorry. the planning can start with polling the teachers and the staff and see who is available and, and can do that. They can also start virtual doing registration, doing planning, um, those sorts of things. The board had voted to have uh, resources allocated to those sorts of things in the fall. Um, and a number of board members have spoken to it. Ms. Pasteur brought up art, um, and uh, Ms. Hen brought up dance, robotics. I mean, there's all other kinds of activities that our children have lost. And now with us coming back, there's an opportunity um, to do more. And that's what it's about. It's about improving what we can do for our students. Thank you for that. Um, I have a question with Dr. Williams. Is this something that you were already planning to do, to bring to us a plan on how um, extracurricular, I'm assuming when you say institute extracurriculars, how extracurricular activities were going to be implemented? So I believe our student member of the board raised this concern or, mm -hmm. or inquiry. And uh, I want to thank uh, Vice Chair Hen because we have to look at the staff that we have in our building mm -hmm. and develop a plan. So we, we just, we were focusing on getting students into our school building. Uh, we can, as the design team working with our, um, our principals, look at a plan to meet this motion. Like I said, we, we're happy to do this work or develop a plan, so that's why I just offered 
that we, okay. we're going to, we, we can do this. We can look at and develop a plan and somehow to look at when and how we can do this. But I must make it clear, we got to have the staff to be willing to do this and to stay mm -hmm. or to be creative. They've been very creative doing the uh, online learning. It was all virtual. And so we're happy to follow back up. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. So the motion has been made and seconded. Are there any additional questions? Okay, hearing none, Ms. Go. Oh, yes, Mr. Mahomza. So, um, would you favor this motion, or do you think it would rush um, your, what you, the design team would come up with? Well, it says a plan. So, um, I believe in, in having activities for students, mm -hmm. um, but in just like we were doing the in person, we have to have the staff as well. So um, without doing, we haven't had a survey or I haven't had conversations with TAPCO around this. Um, we need to talk to our principals about the uh, building use. Mm -hmm. So the logistics we have to look into and, and, and finalize. I, and I believe like our board meeting is um, two weeks from now. Do you think um, that might be too, um, uh, not, not enough time for you to mm -hmm. develop that plan. Although, I, I mean, I support this motion 100%, Ms. Causey. I just, I, w I really want us to um, make sure that we can effectively bring back these groups and allow them to um, participate in their clubs. I just don't want us to uh, create a plan and going back and forth, miscommunication and stuff like that. So I'm just wondering, if, can you tell us a time that you can effectively do it and we can vote on it tonight and not continue making motions? I can't give a time at this point, but we will look at a plan. Uh, we will look at how we are phasing in our students, and we can suggest um, the, 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 the one concern that we may not have would be how many of our sponsors are willing to sponsor the extracurricular activities. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if we will have that data, but we can develop a plan just to address the motion and try to have an update at our next meeting. Okay. Thank you. That's it looks like there's a question from Ms. Jose. Thank you, Mr. Mahomza. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Dr. Williams, um, from what I'm hearing, from what you're telling me, that it looks like we're rushing you into something that you're not ready to do. It's like a half-baked thing might come back to us in two weeks, which will be diverting staff away from Ashley because we still have a whole other cohort opening April 1st week after spring break, the third graders onward. So um, I would rather see something that's well-planned and not half-baked coming in just because we've made a rushed motion. Uh, everybody wants our kids back, and there's nobody on this board that does not want extracurricular activities. But I would rather see something more planned, uh, panned out, and uh, well vetted than just rushing through a motion. So I, you have already said you're going to do that, so I trust you. And I won't be supporting this motion for the simple fact that you're going to follow up on it. Thank you. It looks like there's a question from Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I would suggest, uh, Dr. Williams, that you've been planning for kids to come back to school since the spring. And I'm a little concerned that we don't already have this in place uh, for all of these other clubs and activities that our kids count on. So um, I will be supporting this because I think that uh, you and your team can easily do this. Thank you. If I just make comment, um, it's not that we don't want to do this, and that's not what you were saying, but it, this is similar to our athletic situation. Uh, when Mr. Sai came back and talked about we got to have the right number of coaches, we got to have folks at games to monitor, and so it's the logistics. And so by in two weeks, I may not have all those logistics. We can still talk about the plan, but the other piece, you got to have the staff to actually do the activity. Um, it is an extra duty assignment, and uh, based on circumstances, we just don't know until we do the logistics 
now that we're, we're doing the phase in, we still got to do the logistics in terms of what staff members want to continue to do the extracurricular activities so, or get the EDAs. That's the only thing I'm, I want to raise. It's almost parallel to our conversation we had around athletics. Mm -hmm. You know, once we start, we then turn to our staff and say, okay, we want to do these great things, but there may be conflict. The staff may be um, still in school. The list goes on. So in terms of a plan, we can give a framework. We can develop what we've come up with so far. And I think as we continue down this road, we'll be able to provide some updates. But again, this is really staff dependent. And um, the, the question was raised, you know, I think we got to reach out to our staff to see if they're willing to do all the work that we're asking them to do. And even though it's nice to get an extra pay for this, uh, it's, we just need the, the bodies. We need the, 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 our, our staff to actually do it. Thank you for that. Uh, it looks like we have a comment from Ms. Pastor. Yes. Uh, Dr. Williams, you said you were going to do it. I asked just that at the next one, that you just get us started. We talked about EDAs at the beginning. I talked about it. Ms. Hen made a motion at the beginning of the year. So there may well be some people um, who've already started their EDAs. If you know who they found out who they are, then you can tell us that. I just, we, I, I, I think Ms. Hen, Dr. Hager, and I just wanted to get this started just so it would not languish somewhere, that it gets started. You can't possibly come with a completed plan because all of the different areas about which I think Ms. Hen, Dr. Hagen and I are speaking are so incredibly different. So everybody's timeline is going to be different. I'm perfectly, I was perfectly satisfied with your assertion that you would let us know at the next meeting where you are. It was just about getting the thinking juices started. This is growing into something big. Girl. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. Next, it is Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I call the question. Question has been called. Second. And seconded by who? Ms. Causey. Okay, question's called and seconded by Ms. Causey. And so that ends debate, and we vote on that. Um, Ms. Gover, if we could take a roll call vote on the question. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Matt? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. yes. Ms. Chose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Abstain. Mr. Offerman? Abstain. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so the question was called and passed, so now we will vote on um, Ms. Causey's motion. And the motion she made was that Dr. Williams bring a plan to institute extracurriculars at the next meeting. Okay, if we could take a roll call vote, please, Ms. Gover. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jobes? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasture? Staying. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Abstain. Does eight in favor, two opposed, two abstain. Okay, so eight in favor, so then the motion passes. All right, um, now I had a question about the um, discussion on the reopening of schools, something that you spoke to, Dr. Williams, um, and um, it was answered earlier that summer school is free. I wanted to know, um, and you said it was free for all kids or, or a member of staff did. I wanted to know as far as Saturday school, is that free and is tutoring free? There was talk I heard about tutoring or uh, for um, athletes, but is tutoring offered for all students, at all grades, free of charge, and is Saturday school free as well? That's what we're looking at, and uh, Dr. McComas can chime in. We want to 
look at making it available to our students without without a cost. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. McConus, anything else you want to add I, to that? No, sir, you, you okay. nailed it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And with the Saturday school and the tutoring, would that be year round? So even if you're in summer school, could you still also attend Saturday school if your parents chose and also have tutoring over the summer? The, the tutoring we're looking at offering year round, the Saturday programming, we were not looking at offering in the summertime uh, because we have those other programs going during the summer. So we were looking at the Saturday as part of the supports during the um, spring and then all through next year. Okay, thank you. My pleasure, thank you. Okay, so um, the next item on the agenda was added by Miss Mack, and it was the um, unresolved employee issues. Oh, you had a question, Ms. Causey? Um, yes, I'd like to make a motion that in order to inform families and highlight the successes thus far of hybrid in-person instruction, that Dr. Williams will have staff prepare public relations campaign, including in our global languages. Is there a second to this motion? Okay, hearing no second, we're moving on to item M, which was added to the agenda, which is unresolved employee issues that were um, that was added by Ms. Mack. So did would you want to speak like to me so, to go first? Would you like to speak to that, Dr. Williams, or would you like well, Ms. Mack I'm, to? I would just ask staff to be prepared so we have, um, based on the motion, I ask Ms. Lowry, uh, Mr. Saris, Dr. Scriven, Dr. McComas, and Ms. Burnop and Ms. Simon to be prepared. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Mack, you may go. I'd first of all, I'd like to start off by saying that I know HR and payroll have been working very hard, but we're more than three months after the ransomware attack, and we have employees who went part-time and are still getting full-time pay. We have employees who can't use medical and dental insurance for which they've paid. We have employees who continue to have deductions um, taken from their pay, but no monies are being deposited in their retirement account. We have employees paying for long-term disability in which they've never enrolled. We have employees who completed continuing education classes and they've never been reimbursed. We have parents who can't access transcripts. And while these issues, the issues that I've listed here are not inclusive, they are disparate, but here are some similarities. Um, each of these unresolved issues and many others that I haven't even touched on impacts the accuracy of the W-2s that were issued. Many of the employees impacted have not been able to reach anybody in any department to help them through their issues. These are not isolated issues. We have brought them up at other board meetings, and I think we owe it to our employees to number one, respond to them, Number two, resolve their issues and quickly. And finally, to reissue corrected W-2s. As I said in my motion, I received a W-2 at a home that I haven't even lived at for five years. That is no part of my record with BCPS. And the amount of that W-2 is incorrect. So I, I think we need to do better and we need to do better quickly. And I guess my question is, what are our um, realistic chances of doing so? Thank you, Ms. Mack. Did you want to respond, Dr. Williams? I see the team, Dr. Scriven, Mr. Saris. Yeah, so we, we can get uh, started, Madam Chair. So uh, first and foremost, we want to give an update. I'm just going to frame our portion of the dialogue. We'll, we'll give an update on uh, where we are currently with the W-2 process. I'm going to ask Mr. Saris to back us into um, what it took for us to get to this uh, current point. Uh, and then after he does that, uh, Ms. Burnop, Mrs. Burnop will get on and just give an explanation uh, in terms of next steps as it relates to uh, ESS. So, George, if you could kind of give the history 
uh, with what we needed to do with payroll first um, to give us the data, the data needed to uh, create the W-2s. I would also ask you to speak uh, to the validity of the W-2s and who we have uh, specifically reached out to. Um, and then Barbara uh, can kind of take it from there. So, Mrs. Harris. Thanks, Dr. Scriven. And uh, Ms. Mack, um, I think at the outset, uh, I would say that, that we all agree that all of those issues need to be addressed. And as you also said, we've been working nights and weekends to do so since really November, you know, 28th. Um, so in order to create the W-2s, we first had to recreate six payrolls uh, that took place throughout the month of November and December. And we started with the net pay amounts that we started issuing December 4th. So that um, because we had no system in place, we basically used our, our historical bank files and reissued check, reissued the most recent previous check for every employee. And we did that through December 30th. Uh, we needed to go back uh, and calculate in reverse the gross wages, the taxes, the Social Security, the benefits and the deductions for all those net pay amounts that were simply a dollar amount without a stub. Um, we, uh, we essentially worked until uh, the night of February 26th to uh, recreate those payrolls, uh, uh, review each one and, uh, and make any adjustments that we could before issuing the W-2s. Uh, we had about 21,600 W-2s that went out in the mail uh, on Monday, March 1st. And uh, we uh, were able to reconcile to within a few dollars all but about 700 of those uh, W-2s that uh, that we felt highly confident about. Um, and so uh, those W-2s went out um, and one of the uh, initial concerns that employees noted was uh, that the W-2s listed both the state of Maryland and the state of Pennsylvania, the two states for which we withhold and remit taxes to each of those states. We only have about 600 Pennsylvania residents, but uh, rather than ask them to, uh, to file with the state of Maryland as a non-resident and apply those taxes in Pennsylvania, for many years we withheld uh, those taxes and remitted them directly on their behalf to the state of Pennsylvania. So, the uh, the software uh, that we use generates a an IRS approved W two form, and uh, we did not have the ability initially to modify that print file to remove one state or the other, depending on your residence. So because the form was legally sufficient uh, and we spoke with uh, tax attorneys, tax accountants, and the, the Comptroller's Office of Maryland, and they all uh, validated our uh, interpretation that the forms were valid. And uh, what's more, those forms have been used by other uh, jurisdictions throughout the country, as well as other jurisdictions within the state of Maryland. So uh, we had no information whatsoever that those forms were inappropriate. 
And as I said, at this point, um, I'm aware of only about 106 uh, W-2s that need to be corrected, and that uh, has to do with Social Security, uh, not state, federal uh, taxes or um, or benefits. So um, that is, I think that those are the first two issues, and if uh, that Dr. Scriven wanted me to touch on, and I'm happy to answer any other more specific questions that you have or let Mrs. Burnout go ahead. Um, yes, I do have a specific question. Mr. Saris, thank you for that information. Um, I haven't specifically even mentioned the Pennsylvania issue, but when we have so many other outstanding payroll issues from 2020, how can how can we have issued cor correct W-2s when we have people who um, haven't gotten paid, when we have all teachers should not have had deductions taken out in December, but they did, okay. how can we issue correct W-2s? Well, the W-2s are correct. And if any employee uh, has specific questions, we will address those. But I think, uh, unfortunately, the comptroller issued a letter today uh, questioning the accuracy of the W-2s. And that's really only based on um, public commentary. Uh, so far, as I said, I'm only aware of 106 that need to be corrected. Uh, we're still reviewing uh, several hundred others, but I have not had an employee come to me and say, this W-2 is, is incorrect and tell me why they believe it's incorrect. I'm, it, but I'm happy, you know, to add it to our list for review and possible reissuing if it needs to be correct. Well, I'm going to be adding mine because mine is incorrect. Thank yes. you. And the board, uh, the first paycheck, January 22nd, that the board received, um, there was a problem with all of those. We issued uh, a communication separately to each of the 12 board members explaining that. Ms. Rowe mentioned it again this week. And, yes, those are among the 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 ones that we know need to be corrected. Thank you. Looks like next we have Mr. Kuhn. Hey, Mr. Saris. I know this is a difficult uh, situation you're working through, and I, I, I appreciate it. Um, uh, I, would, I would suggest, though, and um, I know you said that there was uh, a discrepancy in our first pay uh, in, in this year. And I fully understand that because I actually have the, the slips in front of me. <laughs> um, but um, my W-2 shows more that I got paid more than the $7,500 uh, that my stipend is supposed to be. And I guess one of my questions is, was this just a mistake because of the net pay error that you guys were dealing with? Or is or is it incorrect? Because I'm I'm concerned. You know, if my small amount is off, and this you know um, is is whatever it is, but you know I, I I'm concerned uh, about our other the employees across the agency, and when you're dealing with tax documents and you're dealing with the IRS, you know people get very anxious about these things, and they want them want them to be accurate. So. Yes, your the board members W twos are among the ones that need to be corrected. But that was a a very specialized uh, error that had to do with the way the employee files were configured, not with the way uh, the pays uh, were issued. And we did issue corrected paychecks in in twenty twenty one for. Uh, most of the board members, I believe, uh, except for two, who I'm not sure have been paid yet. But uh, if there are any other employees that uh, have errors that they believe 
should be reviewed by our office, then then we'll we're, we will do that gladly. Okay, so what is the process because they don't have access to ESS yet, right? To to check their own pay stubs online, right? That's not available to them. So how do they do it? Well, that's that's a, a big part of the problem that we faced in because we had to reconstruct the data before we could create a W-2. And there were uh, obviously some uh, employees who have their pay stubs through November 6th, but there really isn't any other uh, documentary material other than the employee knows what their uh, their hourly rate is or their annual salary, uh, and they have old pay stubs that they want to compare that to, and ask us to compare make the same comparison. But we have already done that, and as as I said. Uh, we we were able to uh, reconcile all of the historical records with the six payrolls that we recreated to within very within a very small margin of of less than a hundred dollars in terms of wages, which in most cases is within ten or fifteen dollars in tax liability. Okay, so um, just to kind of follow on, if an employee has an issue, um, will you respond to emails? Because I'm hearing that emails are not being responded to. Do they need to call and talk to someone? How how um, can they get this resolved with your office? We, we are answering the phones every day. We have staff in the office and we are answering email, but the email and the calls uh, are of such a volume that it's impossible to to provide same day service. So I think it's best to use email because that gives us a record. It allows the employees to attach a document. Um, but I must say that most of the emails that I get and that I answer there's not a lot of specific information provided. It's primarily uh, concerns about I've heard this and I've heard that and and I'm afraid to file my tax return and um, or I've gone into a third party software and it's asking me a question and I don't know how to answer it. Those are the kinds of responses that I've dealt with, but please, uh, I encourage every employee to give us as much specific information as they can, uh, because we've already uh, done a verification process for thousands of these uh, of employees. And uh, it's certainly possible uh, that we miss something. And uh, the more information that the empl each employee can provide us, the better. Okay, uh, and in order to to follow up with the correct people, Mr. Sears, who do they reach out to? Is that being shared? In, yes, in, the in Office of now? Payroll website and our regular phone number, 443-809-9401. Uh, and we've been posting that information every week on the News Hub. Okay, great. Uh, one last question. Um, if deductions uh, to uh, retirement plans like 403Bs uh, were, were incorrect or were not made for a period of time, um, how, do we, how do we make the employees whole? Because, you know, there's time value of money, especially in the market. How, how, do, we, how do we make those employees whole? So let me say first that uh, we have been uh, making all of the transfers to the 403 and 457 plan providers uh, on a weekly basis. Um, and the issue at this point 
is uh, working with those vendors, there are six of them, to make sure that they are accurately crediting each employee's individual uh, retirement account. And uh, so, and if there are instances where uh, employees uh, can document that they've uh, they've suffered damages, uh, we need that information uh, in order to evaluate the claim. Uh, but the the providers have gotten their money every week, and uh, it's simply a question of making sure they're they have the information from us to make the to credit the proper individuals. So the the investments have been there, uh, but the employee accounts on an individual basis need to be properly credited. That's that's good to know. Thank you, Mr. Sayers. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, apparently, I'm out of time. <laughs> Next, we have Ms. Rowe. Madam Chair. Yes, so. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Scrivens. Yeah, just, just real quick, Ms. Rowe. I just wanted Ms. Burnop just to jump in to give a little more information. And then, Ms. Rowe, we will definitely field your question in the rest of the boards. Uh, but I, I wanted you to have a little more context. Um, Mrs. Burnop, if you can just give an update on the amendments that were made to the W-2 and where we are with ESS, uh, I think that that would be helpful. And then we can continue to fill board members' uh, questions. Um, thank you, Dr. Scriven. Um, what I'd like to share with the board members is because we did get so much concern from um, employees about the Pennsylvania and the Maryland designation, as uh, Mr. Saris explained, we have no, everything that we have seen shows that that's a perfectly adequate W-2. However, employees continue to feel uncomfortable with it. And we therefore re-ran the W-2 process. And we have generated a W-2 that has only Maryland showing for Maryland employees, Pennsylvania showing for Pennsylvania employees. An employee that lived in both states will still continue to see two lines. It does not change any of the dollars that were withheld. Those were correct, as Mr. Saris said. But it will, we believe, give employees a better comfort level that they can have their comfort to give their W-2 to their tax preparer. However, to get those two employees, we need a mechanism to do that. And the normal mechanism for getting to a W-2, this year we mailed them all to employees because of the system being down. We have a tool called Employee Self-Service. It's an application that we have used in the past through our provider. We are going to stand that back up. So we're going to relaunch Employee Self-Service for all of our employees. And we will do that, we hope, this week, as soon as possible. We were testing it all day today, and their staff still working with the vendor on it tonight so that we can open that up to employees, and then they can access this different presentation on the W-2 and print it themselves. So they will have an alternative W-2 with the same dollar amounts, but only showing one state on it if they only lived in one state. So our goal is to have employee self-service available to the employees this week um, as soon as possible. So we're all doing everything we can to get that option available to employees. Um, thank you, Dr. Scriven. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mrs. Burnout. And the floor is all yours, uh, Mrs. Rowe. Thank you for your patience, ma'am. Thank you. So one of the things that I've been hearing, and people have actually sent me images of their W-2s to see this, how do you explain someone whose federal wages, Maryland wages, and Pennsylvania wages are all three different amounts? Because in the, every business I've owned, every employee I've ever had, every interaction, I've done my own taxes since I was 14, I have never had or seen a different state wage and federal wage. And I don't understand how even you could have one federal 
one Maryland and one Pennsylvania wages be three different numbers and you don't even live in Pennsylvania anyway? Please explain so, that. Yeah, the first the the first part of that of deciphering that issue is if you don't live in Pennsylvania, you disregard the Pennsylvania information. And then you need to compare your uh, your federal wage with your Maryland wage. And Maryland wage uh, exempts state retirement. And so most teachers, in fact, most employees of, of any kind are in the state retirement system. And so because Maryland exempts retirement, state retirement contributions for its tax and the federal government does not, those two wages are going to differ by that amount. And, and that's one of the many things we explain in the uh, communication that Dr. Williams issued on Saturday, March 6th. So I think part of the biggest problem that we have is that employees don't have a way to look at a final pay stub or look at any sort of a document to compare that to their W-2 to, to judge the accuracy of their W-2. And those lack of pay stubs is causing confusion. Is there anything we can do to issue some sort of a document that gives the type of accounting breakdown that a pay stub would give for the paychecks that people got. I mean, I understand you had to work backwards to create the accounting, but if you work backwards to create the accounting to create the W-2, then conceivably the accounting exists today. Maybe not as it was created and goes along, but there's something. And people need to see that, I believe. Is there a way we can provide that to them? Well, we, we cannot recreate a pay stub uh, in the form that employees typically receive it. What we have are uh, huge files uh, that have each employee, that have the recreated information uh, for each employee, but it's not in a f format that we can, from which we can generate a pay stub and deliver a pay stub. But that data is what we did use to to reconcile uh, all of the paychecks, all of the W twos, against all of the paychecks that were recreated. So I suppose that's something we can uh, determine uh, whether or not there's any way, you know, to share that. Uh, I can tell you we can't. We can't share that report with 21,000 people. Sure. It's just not available. But if uh, if um, if somebody has a reason to believe that it's that there's an error, uh, we'll certainly look at it. But and I'll consider if there's any possible way to for employees for us to document that for employees. But I think uh, based on the efforts that we made to just start issuing regular paychecks in January and get the W-2s out on Monday, uh, there are probably not enough resources to do that. What I have done is I, I have hired and I'm hiring additional staff to help us um, go back through all of the paychecks to determine whether or not we, as you say, some pe as, as was said, some people were overpaid and determine those amounts, which we've done for a large part, and, and more so make sure we catch up on anybody that was underpaid in November and December. So we have made a lot of progress. Um, we have reconciled all of the AFSCME members' paychecks. Uh, we are working on uh, the TABCO miscellaneous payments from November and December. And uh, we're working on uh, ESPBC reconciliation. So 
uh, by hiring additional staff, my hope is that we get everything reconciled by June 1. That is our goal. Okay, so essentially what you're saying then is myself, other people who have W-2 errors in the numbers, if we don't get something, either a corrected W-2 or something that assures us our W-2 is correct, like, we're going to have to file for extensions with the federal IRS then. I can't, I can't file my taxes right now because I think my numbers are wrong. Okay. So that's time. Do, does that mean? Thank an you, Ms. Rowe. You may wish to apply for an extension, but we're going to get you a corrected W two. Okay. Next is Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm not going to um, take a lot of time because I believe the fellow board members have um, asked a lot of questions and um, staff has provided a lot of information. Uh, but one of the things clearly needs to be improved communications. Um, also, the question is, if we have this issue and we knew this was coming up, I believe we uh, hired staff or hired consultants to help fix this. Um, and so, you know, in terms of planning their work and um, the work of our staff, if we need additional consultants or temps, um, because there are temps that help with payroll, um, then we need to really uh, look at that, because as we know, there's timelines um, coming up with taxes, and it's very uh, anxiety-producing for a lot of our employees. And as the board, uh, in terms of we've heard from board members about their particular W-2s and so forth, um, if ours aren't correct, how, how confident are we in what's happening to our employees? Um, so this is a critical issue. Um, also, another issue relates to communication um, in terms of sending it out in a timely fashion, comprehensive enough that employees know what to do. Um, the board had received a confidential update regarding this, um, but then we, despite being requested, we did not receive the follow-up email that it had gone out to staff. So I'm not even sure if this email has gone out to staff about the ESS. I'd, I do want a confirmation on that because we do need our uh, communications to be better. And that would include, my suggestion would be, to include the documentation from um, Mr. Saris, I think, mentioned the comptroller. Um, and is there something from the IRS? Um, so <clears throat> my question is, has this information about the ESS been distributed, and how can we improve uh, communications? So that information has gone out. Uh, we do weekly updates around payroll uh, that are uploaded in the news hub. Uh, the board, uh, to my knowledge, is copied on uh, all of these correspondences as well. Um, there was an update that just went out on ESS because there was uh, some misinformation that the system was up and running, uh, and indeed it is not. So we've rectified that uh, because we do not want uh, an overload of folks trying to access ESS to uh, print an amended W-2. As Mrs. Burnop alluded to, our goal is uh, to have ESS up and running, um, and that has already been communi uh, to communicated to all of our employees in BCPS. So um, to answer your question, it's been communicated. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I just want to point it out to board members, and I think we all paid in the same um, payroll, uh, because I remember seeing in my uh, W-2s for 2019, we were paid from December of 2019 to 22nd, and it came all the way to January of 2020. So if you look at your 2019 W-2, you will have less than what your stipend is, but that is made up for in the 2020 W-2. Um, that's what I found, and uh, thank you for your explanation, Mrs. Saris. I, I got it. Uh, I, I don't know about other board members, but check your W-2s and you'll see the difference made up in the 2020 W-2. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jose. Next is Mr. McMillian. Uh, 
Mr. George, I'm going to explain a situation that I think applies to a, a group of people. I know a straightforward, no-nonsense teacher that changed his medical insurance, amended it in, in the, within the time frame, and then, unfortunately, his daughter needed two teeth pulled. It cost him $500 out of his pocket. How does that man and other people in that situation go about trying to recap that money? Thank you. Yes, we, um, the virus attack hit us during the open enrollment season. And so all of those uh, plan changes uh, were lost. Uh, the human resources staff came in and worked throughout the, the uh, winter holidays to get that data, collect that data manually. And the, uh, the system that we had hoped to be able to use to update all those benefit, uh, uh, the open enrollment data, uh, did not work out. So um, they are, the, uh, the benefits office is still going back in to reconcile um, and make sure that, that the accounts are brought current. Um, and I believe that, I'll speak for human resources, that as with all of these other issues, uh, we are trying to make employees whole. And that's employees who were underpaid, employees who were overpaid, uh, employees uh, who were paid late, and uh, to make sure that all of those are corrected. Uh, when we reviewed, for example, as I said, we, we had about 700 out of 20, almost 22,000 uh, paychecks and uh, W-2s that were off by more than $100. We made all of those adjustments in favor of the employee. Um, so we'll continue uh, to make employees whole. And my hope is that we can do it by the end of, of this uh, school year. Um, I, I just, that's the goal that we're all working towards. Okay. In regards to this man's $500, what, how can he go about reclaiming that? Or does he just eat it? Well, well absolutely not. Um, once we determine the plan that he should be in, um, we would, uh, he would only be liable. We would uh, reimburse him just like we're reimbursing people for other stipends and, and deductions for which we owe them. Um, I had a similar uh, acquaintance with an employee who went to the dentist and they said, well, you know, we don't have you enrolled. In that case, they were, uh, the doctor was flexible enough to say, okay, you're a BCPS employee and you say that you signed up for Blue Cross Dental, we're going to charge you what we know your responsibility is, and we're going to wait to get reimbursed. In this case, with with that you cited, that unfortunately did not happen, but the amount that the employee is out of pocket between his deductible and the insurance coverage is what we would pay him. Mr. George, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, board members. Um, okay. It looks like the next item on the agenda. Ms. Ms. Scott, I, oh, yes. I just want to uh, close out. Thank you for having this conversation. I just want to reiterate what Mr. Sarris and team have shared, Dr. Scriven. Um, we're going to work to try to make staff members whole. Um, we dealt with the pandemic, we're dealing with the pandemic, and to have the cyber attack with what, how it impacted us that you all have lived through with the rest of us, that we're gonna work really hard to make sure our staff members are whole, 
And as Mr. Sarris has said, um, we appreciate our staff reaching out to our central office staff with questions and concerns. And I would just say, if you're getting questions or emails, um, please direct them to the uh, email address that dot, or, or Mr. Sarris gave actually his phone number, but an email address. So there's the paper trail and that we can follow up and address um, the one-on-one -on -one with our staff members. If they're still having questions about all of this and the impact that the cyber attack has had on our system. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams and staff. Uh, it looks like the next item on the agenda is board committee updates. And committee um, agendas and documents can now be found on board docs under the committee name. So the first uh, committee update we have is from the audit committee. And for that, I call on Mr. McMillian. OK, great. Uh, I want to thank Chairman Scott for giving me the opportunity to develop my leadership skills within this committee. We met on uh, Tuesday, February 16th from 4.30 to 5.45. And I just lost my page. Uh, the reports we discussed was the Office of Internal Audit for the uh, year 21. It was the mid-year update. We looked at the investigative unit statistics. We looked at the summary of procurement card results. Our unfinished business was the OLA audit update. And our new business was the FY22 operating budget analysis. Uh, we're going to meet again. Tuesday, March 16th, next Tuesday at 4.30. And I'm very excited to be involved in this. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Um, oh, it looks like Ms. Calzy has a question for you for his committee update. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, at the last audit committee when I was on the committee, the um, committee had voted to um, bring out, to, had voted to approve the recommendation for the internal audit charter and the audit committee charter to come out to the full board. So I just was wondering when that might be on the agenda for the full board to consider. Ms. Causey, I can answer that. That, that is, is on my board, board comments board or my agenda, agenda setting. Setting. I've setting. I've reached out, but I don't have a commitment, have a commitment on when those, the uh, uh, quarterly, quarterly updates update and also the two charters. Board. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm waiting, waiting for confirmation. For confirmation. Thank, you. Thank you. Great. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. And next is building and contracts. And for that, I call on Ms. Joes. Thank you, Ms. Scott. The building and contracts committee has no updates today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Next is curriculum, curriculum committee. And that's Ms. Pastor. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I'll just report on our next meeting, which is March 18th. And we, and I want to thank Dr. McComas and staff right out the gate. Um, We're going to do the whole session on dyslexia with some conversation on dysgraphia and dyscalculia. And we have just had so many requests for this, and when we get to government, I will address um, another aspect. So thank you for those of you out there who have had a myriad of questions about dyslexia. You want to tune in on March 18th. That will take up most of the meeting, that and reading. So thank you for that. That's it for curriculum, Ms. Skye. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. And next is the Equity Committee, and that would be me, of which I'm the chair. And uh, the Equity Committee met February 18th, and we had the pleasure of hearing from several experts um, in the community and learning more about the Community Eligibility Program, CEP. We also heard from the Office of Nutrition, and um, staff explained to us 
how the program works. The experts who were brought in by our very own Dr. Hager also um, was very instrumental in, in bringing them in so that we could learn more about it, how it works, and how it's applied and implemented at BCPS. So that was a very, very good discussion, and um, I, I learned a lot. So thank you, Dr. Hager, <laughs> for, for your um, uh, leadership in that. Um, we also discussed the equity analysis, um, which was uh, put together um, earlier when we first met, but also um, Ms. Mack was instrumental in pulling out um, certain key points and using the original equity audit to do an analysis of that. And, um, and we use that also as a basis to build on that as, as, as we go forward. So there's, there's more of that to come. Um, we also discussed creating an, audit, an equity advisory group, which um, we're going to speak about that at our next meeting as well, um, which would consist of community stakeholders, uh, teachers, um, uh, various uh, people from the community, hopefully even some students, so that we can um, equally build on our equity work and make sure that we're approaching everything in a holistic, well-rounded fashion. So um, our next equity meeting will be Thursday, March 18th at 4 p.m. Thank you. All right. And next we have Legislative and Government Relations Committee. And for that, I call on Ms. Pastor. Okay. Thank you, um, Ms. Scott. This is a two-parter. Um, at our February meeting, uh, we voted to bring um, Senate Bill 150 uh, for information. Uh, it hasn't happen yet, but Mr. On Thursday, we're having our next government and legislative meeting, and Mr. Baysmore will give us some updates on that particular bill. Know that that bill is um, sort of tangentially attached to um, Delegate Ebersol's bill about for our board, um, noting that six um, members in the event that we have a vacancy uh, on our board and only have 11, that six would be a majority. Senate Bill 150 from Ms. D uh, Senator Sidnor, uh, that amendment asked that we add a 13, a 13th member to our school board. Right now, it is not attached to uh, Delegate um, Ebersol's. So uh, there's no reconciliation there. So there's a lot of conversation that has to happen between them and others. So again, Mr. Baysmore will give us an update. Also, he will, Mr. Baysmore will give us an update on House Bill 1197, which does not at this point have a Senate crossover. So he will give us um, more information as well. But I now want to bring us to uh, Senate Bill 126, House Bill 237. At our last board meeting, Mr. Mahomza made a motion and Ms. Hen seconded that motion and the committee unanimously um, support it. So tonight we are bringing it to the board, um, to the board uh, for your support. I sent out the information to you, so I will just uh, give you a quick uh, overview before I do the motion. And it is that in that uh, the. Maryland State Department of Education create an advisory group that will create a reading and dyslexia handbook that will be available to school systems around the state as well as the public by June 1st of 2022. Um, and so we are embracing this and, and finding this timely in light of our curriculum uh, discussion on next Thursday. So I move that the Baltimore County School Board support Senate Bill 126, House Bill 237, requiring MSDE 
to create an advisory group to develop a reading and dyslexia handbook to be made available to school systems and the public by June 1st, 2022. Second, Ms. Causey. It doesn't Lots of seconds. Second. It's coming from, it's coming from the committee. But thank you. <laughs> Sounds like it's a lot of support for that. Um, and you spoke to the motion. Um, were there any questions? Okay. All right, Ms. Gover, may we take a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahamsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. The Thank motion passes. You Thank you, Ms. Scott. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. Okay, and then we have our policy review committee, of which I am a chair. And the policy review committee met on February 22nd, and uh, we discussed. Um, policy unfinished business uh, policy 6002 selection of instructional materials uh, another policy on meetings uh, policy special rules for electronic meetings and um, also uh, meetings in the agenda what we also discussed was our first ever social media policy that we're working to create and um, and and discuss that and that'll be forthcoming um, a, a bit later we discuss the ethics code policy policy 8221 board officers and vice chair and um, the next policy and review committee meeting will be March 15th at 4 30 p.m. Yeah. Thank you. And we have, uh, as Ms. Hen um, uh, is chairing the newly formed budget committee. So, Ms. Hen, are you prepared to say something about the committee? I know. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, so, I'd like to thank Ms. Scott for allowing me to chair the newly established budget committee, um, which was established, and also to thank the board for. Um, your support of this committee. And assigned to that committee are Ms. Pesture as vice chair and Mr. McMillian. So I look forward to working with the committee. Our first meeting has not yet been scheduled, but I'm looking to schedule that either this month or, or next month. So that's my update at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for that, Ms. Hen. Um, it looks like Ms. Colsey has a question for you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Actually, what I'd like to do is make a motion to add board member Lisa Mack to the budget committee. Um, Mr. Bersades, correct me if, um, just for my understanding, but I believe that motion is out of order because that would be um, changing our policy. I thought the policy was for the board chair to appoint um, committee members. So our policy does um, uh, give the responsibility to the board chair, and there's uh, also conversation in the handbook about uh, building consensus and discussing with board members their interests. Um, and I think that in this regard, Ms. Mack has been overlooked. Um, also, it has been uh, set by precedent in a board meeting, I believe it was in May, where uh, Ms. Joes made a motion to form a committee um, and to name you as the chair of that mm -hmm. committee. So the board voted to approve that. So I believe that it is consistent with um, policy, the board handbook, and also board practice. So I would say, one, that, um, first of all, when you made your committee assignments, um, your committee assignments were respected. I respected you, and I did not say things about members being overlooked. Um, and I apologize I, for that, that Well, it was already said. Um, that's the first thing. So I, I, I do um, find that little unnecessary. Um, second of all, uh, Mr. Bersades, if you could chime in, but it does seem to me that the policy um, would need to be changed in order for that to happen. And what you had just said earlier in regards to um, you, like when we, when you just asked, when it was asked about making stakeholders it just, you know, overriding the policy. You said that we would need to go and change the policy first. So I want to know if that would also apply to this situation, to this motion as well. 
Are you there, Mr. Mercedes? Yes, yeah, so, um, I thought that last portion was for uh, Ms. Causey. No, that was uh, for Ms. Causey, but the, <laughs> what I was asking for you is weighing in um, legal advice as far as um, that's a policy that the chair decides who is on each committee, and that policy was respected during Ms. Causey's tenure. Um, but what I wanted to know is that if we wanted to change the policy where we just add board members and um, override the chair's decision, then isn't that something that would need to be changed in policy first? That was my understanding. If, if there is a policy that deals with committee assignments— and I, I must admit, I, I don't have all of the policies uh, at, the, at my fingertips. Uh, and I'm not sure if there is a policy that deals with uh, committee assignments. So I, I, would, I would need to look at that. So um, I'm going to um, just make a comment. Um, yes, as the chair, I did uh, communicate uh, actively with board members. Uh, Ms. Hen and I, um, at multiple points, sent out um, open positions, got input of who wanted to be on the committees and so forth. There were at times, um, but like I said, the board did approve to, it, per a motion in an open board meeting, to have you be the chair of the equity committee. And I think that that's worked out very well. So um, I don't think it's inconsistent with policy. Um, and I don't think it's inconsistent with what the board has done. Ms. Gover, before. do you have the policy if number? The, the um, other issue I would it's the, um, the uh, role of the chair to assign uh, committee assignments. The other thing I would point out from a parliamentary procedure is that uh, the board has the opportunity to appeal the ruling of the chair. So if well, it's not a ruling it if it's going way. against policy. Because it's not, a, it's not a ruling of the chair. If it's a policy, then we would need to go in PRC, as we did with the other policy, and make that change. So um, I don't know if Madam the policies chair? are up on our website. Yes, Mr. Mercedes. I'm, I'm just looking at the uh, It's 8221. 8221. 8221. Yep, 2D. 2D. Madam Chair, I have another comment related to that. I also wanted to point out that well, when a committee has Scott, three, Yes, the motion hasn't come to the floor yet, so we... No, this, this is by way of background for um, edification of the whole board. Uh, when there is a committee that only has three members, and Mr. Brusades can confirm this because he wrote an um, advisory opinion on it. Um, when there is a committee with only three members, um, then because of quorum and Open Meetings Act requirements, the vice chair cannot attend the agenda setting meeting. So it makes it um, a little less collaborative. Um, so this is not uh, taking anyone away that you've put on the committee, um, but it is just, in fact, just adding an additional member. So yes, it would be adding an additional member. Um, Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Mercedes. Looking at policy, 8221, it is, uh, it parallels uh, the board handbook, which provides that the board chair shall have the uh, duty of uh, making committee assignments. So then if we wanted to circumvent that, then is that something much, then? Much, much in the same way that we, that the board went through with the uh, sending it back to the policy review committee on the other item earlier today, that that same logic would apply here. Okay. So then that's something then that we could um, look at that policy and in policy and review committees, just as we as we did earlier. So, Madam right. Chair, I would just okay. withdraw so. my motion, and I would just request that you uh, consider adding Ms. Mack to the budget committee. Um, she as, uh, is documented through the operating budget and capital budget cycles, uh, has uh, delved in, uh, submitted many questions, had a lot of discussion. Um, she also voted for the budget committee, um, which some other members have not. So I think that her commitment, her experience um, also as a retired executive from a Fortune 50 company, um, she would be an asset to the committee. Thank you. Thank you. you.
Yes, it looks like we have some questions here. It looks like there's a question from Ms. Mack, or excuse me, a comment from Ms. Mack, and then Ms. Jose. Um, yes. Well, I'd like to thank Ms. Causey. I did not ask Ms. Causey to do this, but so I'd like to thank her for her comments. Um, Ms. Um, um, Scott, as you know, I have emailed you twice about this um, because I, you know, I love budgets. I have a master's degree in finance. Um, I have worked diligently on the last three budgets. Um, I have submitted questions. I um, have made motions, and not all board members can say that. But we don't need to deliberate this here. Um, I will continue to pursue this. Um, and again, I just want to be clear that I can always speak for myself, and I will pursue this in a, in a different manner. Point, Madam Chair, point of order. Oh, point of order? Yeah. Sorry. I'm just um, a little lost. Is there a motion on the floor? She withdrew her motion. So are we, are we still commenting on this? I'm just... So since the motion was withdrawn, um, Josh, I don't know if everybody could hear you. Josh raised a point of order. Yeah, Go ahead, I, say it. Sorry, I, I was just, because uh, the motion was withdrawn. I, I don't know why we're commenting on this. I mean, the motion is withdrawn. Motion is withdrawn, OK. So Madam board, Chair. excuse me, Madam Chair. So give um, members a chance to voice their opinions. Um, yeah, Ms. Jose was next. I, I, yeah, the motion was withdrawn. Um, I was just giving members a chance to voice their opinion. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Madam Chair. Well, Ms. Jose was next. Ms. Jose was next. Ms. I understand, but the motion was withdrawn. Um, the motion was withdrawn, to my understanding. Uh, my concern is this board always brings in motions at 11 o'clock at night, um, you know, just ramrods through these motions. And when Ms. Kazi was chair, we never questioned her committee assignments. In fact, I was placed on no committee, so that should be noted. I, I didn't, I did ask about it, but I was placed on no committees. And nobody made a motion to add me on to anything else. When I did make the equity committee, that was on because Ms. Mack, you, Ms. Scott, you had asked for that equity committee for over a year. When I made the motion, I didn't ask for myself to be chair. Um, what I find is really troubling about, you know, and, and this comes back to privilege, the, the, the way you guys just ramrod to things and we have to somehow adjust to it because that's what you want. So you're going to put your foot down and, and get it anyways. And, you know, and this comes from my point of as a woman of color, how we have to stay subdued while you know, you have a first black chair and the way you guys have treated her, the way you guys interrupt her, the way you guys have spoken. And even in uh, social media, I've seen some of you uh, dragging her through the mud and nobody's going to say it but me. I'm a blunt person and I will say it. It is atrocious the way you've been treated and this motion, commotion at the end of, you know, a meeting that should have ended two hours ago. And here we are, motion upon motion coming on the floor. Uh, without blindsiding you all the time. It, it is extremely disgraceful the way um, these board members are acting towards you. And I'm sorry, Ms. Scott, because I would like to apologize to you for that. Thank you, Ms. Jose. It looks next like we have a comment from Ms. Pastor. Yeah, um, I want to ask a question. Um, I've seen, I heard it asked, and it was in the chat, about um, three um, and as a committee, and I do recall that the, um, un unless I'm losing someone, that when I was made chair of government, there were only three people on that committee. Um, and, and, yeah, there were only three people. So my understanding, because I'm one of the um, Open Meetings Act people um, is that if the chair and the vice chair are speaking administratively, so I would like someone, uh, Mr. Persades, to uh, offer a ruling on this, that if we are just speaking in terms of um, admin speaking administratively in terms of agenda planning, et cetera, we are able to talk. Um, we are not able to do actionable items. That is what creates a problem, actionable. But agenda uh, planning, 
does not, in my understanding, fall under that. So I'd like some information on that, please. Hello, Ms. Pastor. Uh, that is something I would uh, rather look into a little more closely than give you an off-the-cuff answer. Okay. All right. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, we need to move on because every, everybody has spoken once. The motion was withdrawn. So moving on. The next item on the agenda. Um, the next me, item is on the Chair. agenda. I'm excuse me. Order, excuse me. Chair. No, I'm sorry. No, excuse me, Ms. Causey, please. We're trying to move on. The motion was withdrawn. Everyone spoke. We're now on the next agenda item. Madam so Chair, the next I'm item on the agenda order that a board member are, made disparaging remarks specifically. Excuse me, Ms. Causey, that's not a point of order. That's not a point of order. order Ms. Causey, you're out of order. It is a point of order. It is a point of order. It is not a point of order. Point of order is about the running and the operations of the meeting. That's correct. It's and not if the, someone says something that you don't like. That's not a point of order. So. Let's Adam move Chair, on. It is a point the of next order item to on the agenda uh, is to the board information norms, items, which, which include not to the Southeast Area Education Advisory Council members. meeting minutes of November 16th, 2020, board members, I'm and January 25th, 2021. On my point Students of order. count 2020 report update on key school legislative 2021. Consideration of agenda items for future board meetings. The next item on the agenda is the, what I just said, consideration of agenda items for future board meetings. And for that, I call first Ms. Rowe. It's a long list, I'll pass. Okay, next is Ms. Causey. Madam Chair, I'm appealing the ruling of the board that my point of order is out of order. There and was I would no ask ruling. Mr. Brusades to comment on that. It's my understanding that the chair determined that there was no uh, personal affront. Uh, the chair does get to decide that, uh, but Ms. Kazi is correct that the board can vote on uh, the chair's decision. My understanding was that a point of order is for how board meetings are run, not because someone says something that you don't like or may disagree with. Madam Chair, may, this is Ms. Henman. Sorry, I wanted to hear from Mr. Brusades. Right. I've been trying to come. That, 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 was, a, that was a ruling, Madam Chair, that, that you made, though, on whether uh, it was a point of order or not. And that is something that the uh, you, you are absolutely within your authority to make that ruling, and the full board can uh, weigh in on that. Okay. Yes, Mr. Mahomsa. In the interest of the board and the public, can we just all follow the rules and end this meeting? It's getting late, and I understand your point of order. Can we just... Solve this in administrative function. This is not how board members should act. The public deserves better. Everyone deserves better. Again, can we just move on? For so, the Mr. Mahamza, I appreciate your comments, and I absolutely agree that this board should do better, and that our constituents deserve better, and that my, uh, as Mr. Brusetti said, that I have a correct motion. Uh, uh, and I am. What I am doing is I am asking the board to appeal the um, chair's ruling that my point of order is out of order, and I would like to make a comment about the um, inaccurate and disparaging comments that were made earlier. So I would ask board members if you would um, make a motion to vote to allow me to make my comments regarding that prior comment. So do we just do Mr. Is there a second vote? Well, what, what the, it, the, the issue is, shall the ruling of the chair be sustained, the, the chair's ruling on the point of order? And so that is the question before the board. Madam Chair, I'd like to comment. This is Ms. Hen. Yes, Ms. Hen. A board member can call a point of order when another board member is in decorum. I believe that applies in this case. The chair can rule on the, the point of order, and any board member can appeal the chair's decision. So we've... So then the rule right now then is or Ms. Causey has appealed my decision that there was not a point of order. So what Mr. Mercedes, what we're to do now is to vote 
to see if the board agrees um, to uphold my point of order or sustain your ruling to sustain my ruling. Yes. Okay, so we're voting now because it is late and confusing. So we're voting now to see if we're going to sustain my ruling that it's not a point of order. Correct. Okay. So, Mr. Mercedes, the my question is, if I don't want to sustain it, my vote would be no. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you. And if you do want to sustain it, it would be yes. Correct. And and there's no conversation in this. Is that correct, Mr. Mercedes, or not? No, it's no, not debatable. It is debatable. Okay. Then. Doesn't have. That doesn't mean you have to. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would just like to see us. Uh, deal with this, as someone said, um, in, a in, in a in a manner that is not out here with the public, that we show them that those of us who are taking care of their children can also have conversations, be upset with each other, but still have conversations with each other um, versus putting them in the middle of this. My line is, our children are watching, and we need to be better angels okay. than this. Yes. I 100% agree with you, Ms. Pastor. I think Ms. Causey uh, is entitled um, to rebut any comments, but I think the per perfect way to do this is in closed session, administrative uh, session, where board members can speak freely, um, cannot, um, can make comments that might not, um, let's say if it involves um, uh, closed session items, so they don't have to worry about that thing. I think um, the public really just wants us to go through our agenda productively, um, address their concerns, and handle the board's business behind the scenes. And I'm, I'm really, I don't really know what is gonna happen with this vote. Uh, are we gonna give more time to uh, talk about the comments were made prior to? Is that what you were? Goal is, Ms. Halsey? My goal is to address the inaccurate and disparaging comments that were made that were out of order. And I, I think. But can we do it so that we show our children an example and our parents to make them feel that we are ones who can? Be okay. civil and, yes. and do this. So and then Matt was gracious enough yes. to say, I can handle my issue on my own. Let us, can't we just do that? I'm going to have a okay. ride. Yeah. So people. we don't actually, I, we I could, agree excuse I, me, I, I Pesh, I'm, I'm sorry. Excuse, I agree with Ms. Pesh. I recall my time. Yeah. Excuse me. Go ahead, finish. I think what is more appropriate that. is having another board retreat than going over this item any longer. I yeah. Think. That's the best course of action, and I would not vote for this because we should not spend any more minute arguing and just being divisive in the in public. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So Can I'm sorry. I'm going to respond this, because Ms. Pastor made a very important point Ms. Cousin, about that our children are watching so and our parents can... are watching. And part of what's part of what is important to understand is to not accept bullying okay. and to address it. Okay. So we can vote. To Can we vote, please? Or yes. not sustain? Correct. Yes. Let's vote. Oh, Ms. Call, um, was there a second? Excuse I didn't me, hear I a second. I, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I didn't hear a second to Ms. Causey's motion. Second, Mac. Okay. All right. So um, if we could vote. I'm sorry. Somebody this, said they have, have another comment. This is Lily Rose. This is a debatable motion. So I wanted to make my comment. Yes. And I'm just reading from Section 4 of Robert's Rules of Order. Debate must be confined to the merits of the pending question. Speakers must address their remarks to the chair, maintain a courteous tone, and especially in reference to any divergence of opinion, should avoid injecting a personal note into debate. To this end, they must never attack or make any allusion to the motives of members. As already noted, speakers should refer to officers only by title, and should avoid the mention of other members' names as much as possible. And it goes on, but I think that section is clear, that when you start accusing people of having racialized motivations, that is contrary to this passage in Robert's Rules of Order. So I am, um, I do think that the chair's ruling should be overruled. 
Okay, let's vote, Ms. Gover. And this um, calls. Can we repeat the motion, please? Motion. Whether to sustain the chair's ruling. Okay, whether to sustain the chair's ruling. If you want to sustain the chair's ruling, you vote yes. If you want disagree with the chair's ruling, then you vote no. Correct. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, if we could vote, please. Ms. Rao? No. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? Abstain. Ms. Jose? Ms. Hen? No. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Ms. Pasture? You're muted. Yes. Mr. Kuhn? No. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? Yes. Three in favor, six opposed, one abstain, two absent. So is the decision of the chair upheld? If it's six, it's not majority. Anyway. Oh, it's? No. No, okay. Madam Chair, may I address my point of order? Yes, please do. There have been continuing remarks that are inappropriate and that take time and energy away from the real work that needs to happen. And I would like uh, to have a discussion about that, whether as Mr. Mahomes pointed out, as a board retreat or a specific administrative function um, session, because it is, um, it, it's unacceptable. And we've received emails uh, from constituents and it's, it's wasting time. And I wish I didn't have to. Uh, address it. But I also will not be bullied. I will not let other people uh, think that inappropriate conduct is accepted by this board. Thank you. So the next item on the agenda is board member comments. And with that, we'll start with Ms. Rowe. Do you have any comments this evening, Ms. Rowe? I do have um, a comment. I would just like to thank the comptroller's office and comptroller Peter Francho for extending the tax filing deadline for um, employees who are having trouble with their W-2 to July 15th. As we heard tonight, it's likely to be June before people who are having problems get those corrections. And we're not talking about a handful of people. We're talking about a hundred or more people or even more than that. But I know that people have sent me W-2s, people have sent other board members W-2s, people have sent the comptroller's office W-2s, and um, <coughs> CABCO representatives have all been hearing from people, not just because Maryland and PA are both on the same W-2 and they only live in one state, but because people also feel that the numbers are incorrect, that they're either overpaid or underpaid. And I just want to thank the comptroller for acknowledging that this is, in fact, a real issue and that every individual has a right to an accurate W-2 and that he's going to extend the filing deadline to July 15th. So thank you for that, comptroller. And I really hope that we can get these issues resolved as quickly as possible so that people don't have stimulus money held up and everything else because they can't file their federal taxes. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Next is Ms. Causey. Madam Chair, if someone can go before me, please. Thank you. Next is Ms. Mack. Yes. On um, last Monday, as part of Read Across America, I had the pleasure to read to a third grade class at a local elementary school. The book I chose to read was I Met a Moose in Maine One Day. The students were engaging and they appeared to be engaged. We pondered why, and this is a question for Dr. McComas if she's still on, we pondered why one goose is called a goose and one moose is called a moose, but more than one goose becomes geese, while more than one moose is not meese. <laughs> Our youngest daughter was fortunate to have Miss Flynn as a teacher. Um, I am happy to see that for the last 25 years, 
Many students have benefited from having Miss Flynn as a teacher, just as our daughter did. And it looks like Miss Dr. McComas is ready to answer. <laughs> I just want to compliment you, Miss Mack. Thanks for bringing us back to children and literacy. So thank you. We'll, we'll talk about it in curriculum. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you. Next is Mr. McMillan. Uh, I was very excited to visit Colgate Elementary with Dr. Williams and Dr. Roberts last uh, Thursday or Friday. Colgate Elementary, if you get the chance to do the virtual tour, do this. There's over, There's over 80,000 square feet in that three-story building. That is an older community in East Baltimore County. It needs a, a hub, and this school is going to be a, a community hub for decades to become. Uh, I've been to the fairgrounds four times volunteering. That's an amazing process. Uh, I've seen bus drivers, cafeteria workers, teachers, administrators, uh, coaches, athletic directors it's just a wonderful process to see people want to get the opportunity to get their shot uh, I'm looking, I'm looking forward, forward to the athletic, athletic competition season competitive, competitive season beginning this week spectators please, please behave and do not put undue stress, stress on the athletic and leadership uh, and school leadership of those schools thank you the spring season will begin on April 16th this is a wonderful opportunity because because starting six weeks later than we normally did it was always March 1st now it's April 16th the weather is so much better so I'm anticipating I have high expectations that we're going to have a lot of kids come out this spring uh, so please seriously consider that and I know it's probably not too much listening listening right now, but parents, but parents please, please get behind, get behind your, your students support and support and encourage them to get to those grades up and keep those grades, grades up this spring. Thank, Thank you very much. much. <laughs> uh, next is Ms. Joes. Okay. Next is Ms. Hen. Thank you. Well, Mr. McMillian is a tough act to follow. Um, thank you, Mr. McMillian, for that update. I, too, was excited to be back in two of our schools yesterday. Um, Mays Chapel and Riderwood. The schools look gorgeous. The safety protocols that are in place are amazing. I want to thank um, those administrators and our staff for all their hard work in preparing for the safe return of our students. Um, it's clear the, the effort that has gone into preparing your facilities um, has just been out, you know, incredible. Um, I enjoyed visiting classrooms in both schools. Um, teachers doing a fantastic job with hybrid instruction, um, juggling something new. I was just thoroughly impressed. Um, they all made it seem like they've been doing this for years. You, you would not have expected that this was um, the first couple of weeks back, but um, it was absolutely incredible to see and incredible to be back um, with students and to see everybody's smiling faces. So. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you, Ms. Byers, for the opportunity. Um, it was a great start to the week. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Next, Mr. Mahomza. Yes, thank you. Um, on a lighter note, I just want to thank this board for continuing the streak of not going past midnight. I think I thank you all. And I know we've been doing a lot of work and um, a lot of conversation that's taken place, but um, a lot of members in the community are watching and sadly they cannot stay for the whole meeting. So uh, I've heard them um, really, um, th those appreciations for us um, finishing um, in an orderly uh, manner. <coughs> Sorry, um, I don't have much to comment about, but just to congratulate uh, uh, Dr. Williams, the school system for um, uh, effectively reopening um, for our young younger learners and um, beginning uh, athletics uh, practices uh, earlier uh, in the last couple of weeks and also uh, the athletic competitions this week. I'm excited for our students and um, I know our community is also excited and I just hope um, we can talk. Uh, we can move past uh, the stark era uh, in our, our education. Other than that, um, I have nothing else to comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mahumza. Next is Mr. Alferman. Okay. Uh, next is Ms. Pastor. Yes, I um through this whole pandemic, I have been going. Um, to classes and watching them virtually. 
from preschool to the 12th grade, east side, west side. And I want to thank all of the teachers who, in the midst of all of this, have invited me in to see some wonderful, wonderful instruction going on and just beautiful, beautiful children. And today, to cap it off, to actually go back into a building, I want to thank uh, Dr. Williams um, for allowing me to uh, join him, Executive Director Morrow, um, uh, Community Soup, Dr. Jones, and uh, Ms. Causey, as we were so nicely welcomed by Principal Filderman at Hebville. It was wonderful seeing the children at work. It was wonderful watching these teachers juggling, doing what they do to make excellence happen. To make excellence happen for our children, whether they were virtual or live. And I look forward to going out into schools again and seeing them work. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. Uh, next is Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I would just like to make a few comments. I know that <laughs> the time is late and I'm, I don't really want to extend the meeting uh, too much. Um, uh, I believe we are halfway through the third quarter already. That leaves a quarter and a half left of the school year and children are just getting into classes. Um, I'm happy that they're in, uh, at least some of them are in, and they're getting a taste uh, of in-person education. They're seeing their friends, they're interacting with their teachers face-to-face. -face. This is fantastic. Um, and I hope that we can um, uh, continue to roll this out smoothly uh, as the bulk of our children won't be in class until April 6th. Um, I would suggest and uh, challenge Dr. Williams and his team to think about the measures and if they continue to rapidly change for the better, uh, consider four days a week classes, um, uh, especially for children that are vulnerable and possibly um, uh, you know, that have IEPs and they need more one-on-one -on -one instruction. If we can make that possible even for them, I think that would be great. Um, and turning towards graduation, we're close. Uh, I have one graduating <laughs> myself, uh, which is uh, sad and exciting at the same time. Um, and um, I look forward to celebrating that. And I look forward to uh, what we can do to do that safely and make that happen for everyone. So. Again, thank you for your time and all the work that's happening. Um, keep it up, and uh, and uh, best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Um, yes, very briefly. Um, I've been on the board for almost a year now, and I tonight I finally had the opportunity to meet many of my board members and our staff in real human form, and so I want to thank everyone tell who helped to make this hybrid board meeting happen tonight. Um, I want to send lots of positive thoughts to our teachers and students as they're all adapting to the new hybrid model and thank them for their incredible hard work and dedication. I know this is a, a big change and so I really appreciate everything that everyone's doing. I also want to give a shout out to Food and Nutrition Services. So uh, they're also doing something very new. They're feeding kids in schools and in the community at the same time. And so giving kids breakfast and lunch in school to anyone who wants it plus still feeding kids in the community. Um, it's, again, another new adventure for those folks who've been so dedicated for nearly a year now. I'm always dedicated, but have really been exceptional during the pandemic. And I just want to say good luck to all the athletes in their first game on Friday. And that's it. Thank you. Ms. Colsey? Thank you, Madam Chair. As we come to the one-year anniversary of the COVID-19 pandemic locking down our family, schools, businesses, faith communities, hobbies, travel, and so much more, it is appropriate to take time for reflection on all that has occurred as individuals, families, schools, our school system, our school board, community, county, the state and beyond. So many dramatic circumstances, loss of loved ones, grief, anxiety. Others have suffered through illness, loss of jobs, loss of school, disconnected from family, faith groups, friends and other supports. 
uh, disparities widening in our communities and social justice more urgent. For my brief comments tonight, I want to focus, though, on the future. Personally, professionally, and in my board service, I am the most hopeful I have been in a year. With now three vaccines available, improving health metrics, the hope and the optimism is, I hope, expanding. Um, research and data from the past year has helped to uh, provide guidance uh, so that we can re-engage with life. I'm also um, really excited, and it's been encouraging to be able to volunteer uh, with Mr. McMillian, uh, Dr. Williams, and, and hundreds of other BCPS employees to be involved in that. I want to thank the County Executive Osefsky and Dr. Branch, the Director of Baltimore County Health Department, for a very organized, efficient process. Dr. Branch, his team, staff from throughout the county, including Baltimore County Police Department, the Fire Department, Maryland Guard, they're implementing a very organized and efficient process. I volunteered one day where there were 1,200 educators received their shots in about three hours. So all we need is more medicine and we will get to everyone. Um, and it, it was great to see everyone there. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Maryland State Fairgrounds and Agricultural Society for hosting the vaccine clinic uh, on their um, campus there in the Cow Palace. And um, I also want to say that I'm glad the decision was made to allow the games to continue. It's unfortunate what was lost, but I hope that that can even be revisited as the weeks move on um, to provide some additional competitions for those students. Um, also, hopefully, as the county executive and the health department increase community participation, uh, that BCPS aligns with that at the earliest opportunity. Um, and finally, and most importantly, uh, my hopeful and optimism comes from visiting schools yesterday and today. Absolute pure joy. Uh, I just want to thank Mays Chapel Elementary School, Riderwood Elementary School, Hebville Elementary School, Featherbed Lane Elementary School for um, hosting those visits that I was able to attend, and I know there were others. Um, and, and what's happening there, what we saw there, I know is happening and will happen in every school. Um, the uh, building operations teams, administrators, teachers, so many others, the bus drivers, as was mentioned, food <coughs> service, nurses, assistants, created safe, healthy, engaging, and exciting learning environments. Staff and students were so happy to reconnect. Teachers were working diligently to implement concurrent instruction. And it was so rewarding to see the recovery from the pandemic is underway for our students and our school system. I look forward to the next meeting when we hear more from the superintendent and staff about implementing extracurriculars, uh, considering expanding instruction um, as, as that can get worked out. We know that that's a complicated situation, but um, we know that other districts are doing it, and we want our children to have that opportunity. So I want to thank you all very much and just really looking forward to the future. Thank you, Ms. Clausey. Um, and I will give my comments last. I've been speaking all night, um, so I will be very brief. I was um, very um, happy to hear about the summer school programs, um, to hear about the after school tutoring, and to hear about the Saturday school. Um, it's my um, hope that it will be free for all students. Um, I know we've spoken a lot about athletics and extracurricular activities, but um, our primary goal is to educate our students and our children, and so offering them um, all the supports that they need during um, these trying times uh, with tutoring and summer school extended day programs, I, I think it's, it's just really going to be very helpful. So um, I'd like to thank the staff and Dr. Williams for presenting us with that. So thank you. Okay, so we had our board member comments. So the next item on the agenda is um, for informational items, which include the Southeast Area Educational Advisory Council meeting minutes of November 16th, 2020, and January 25th, 2021, Students Count 2020 report, update on key school legislation. I'm sorry, you said I went... No, okay, I didn't think I did. All right. And then um, the last item is the, well, the next item on the agenda is consideration of agenda items for future board meetings. So, um, again, I'll start with that. Uh, Ms. Rowe? I have nothing, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Ms. Causey? 
Thank you. Um, I would like to um, see on the agenda time to discuss the student counts. Um, we are in the uh, midst of the My App, My iPass, uh, the multi year improvement plan for all schools. And it has been um, discussed multiple times that there has not been an analysis of the accuracy of the projections. And we also understand that there's been a disruption to those projections because of the pandemic. Um, so I feel that that really needs a lot of analysis, and I think that there should be an opportunity for the full board to discuss it. Uh, the board did receive an update uh, with an analysis, but it was all schools combined. It was not individual schools. And really, that is what needs to be done, is the individual schools. And um, so I think that that can be done. Um, also, just to uh, continue to improve communications, and maybe there can be a an agenda item relating to uh, communication um, uh, paths and just having some more standard uh, communications that goes out to the to the whole community. Um, and there's a number of others that I've submitted in the past that um, you're already aware of. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Ms. Mack. Yes, I would just like to piggyback on something that you just said, Ms. Scott, that, that a lot of what we do is important, but we are an academic institution. And we did receive a request from a major stakeholder that at every board meeting, we talk about academic outcomes or academic achievement. And I would like to bring that up again, that we should be talking about academic outcomes and academic achievement at least once a month. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Um, next is Mr. McMillian. Yes, quickly. I would just like to get confirmation on the internal audit quarterly report that we can do it in April, April July, July, October, and January, and have it set on the, the, on the, on the, on the agenda. agenda. And then, and then it's some time for a brief audit, audit committee charter discussion, discussion and the Office, and the Office of, of Internal Audit Charter. Charter. And, that and that would just take a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Um, Ms. Jose? Ms. Hen? Thank you. Given the recent passage of Built to Learn and the influx of state capital funding, I would like to see the roadmap for our capital improvement plan and updated construction um, timeframes and schedules for current projects on that plan. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Mr. Mahomza? I have no agenda item to add. Thank you, Mr. Mahomza. Mr. Offerman? Okay. Uh, Ms. Pastor? Okay. Mr. Kuhn? Thank you, Ms. Scott. I would like to talk about SAT tests. I'd like to talk about APs in depth across the entire system. And I would like to hone in on a specific contract that um, Mr. Saris had mentioned at one point during the budget discussion uh, when I was asking about equipment that costs six million dollars a year and he stated that it was a 20-year performance um, contract and I would like to understand the details of something that we have contracted for for 20 years with over a six million dollar price tag every year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Dr. Hager? I have nothing to add. Thank you. Um, and last is me. And um, I don't have anything to add at, at this time, but I really like hearing um, board members um, say what they would like to see and, and prioritize things. So thank you. Madam Chair, if I may. Okay, and I just wanted yes. to thank you for facilitating the first ever Board of Education of Baltimore County hybrid slash virtual <laughs> meeting. It's a lot that's going on, and I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So the next item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next hybrid meeting will be held on Tuesday, March 23rd, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight, and the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.